Good morning and welcome to the 18th meeting in 2022 of the Finance and Public Administration Committee. The first item on our agenda is to take evidence from the Scottish Fiscal Commission and then the Cabinet Secretary for Finance and the Economy on Scotland's economic and fiscal forecasts at May 22 and the Scottish Government's resource spending review and medium term financial strategy. For our first evidence session, a welcome to the meeting. Dame Susan Rice, DBE, Chair of the Scottish Fiscal Commission. Professor Francis Breeden, Commissioner, Professor David Ulf, Commissioner, and John Ireland, Chief Executive of the Commission. Before we open to questions, can I ask Dame Susan to make any opening remarks? Good morning, Susan. Over to Good you. morning, convener, and all of you, and thank you for inviting us to discuss our most recent forecasts. I'm pleased uh, to be joined by my colleagues whom we've just introduced. I'll say a few words about the economic context before turning to our tax and social security forecasts and their implications for the government's funding and spending. The outlook for the Scottish economy is much more uncertain than in our forecast last December, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, rising energy prices, and further global supply chain disruptions on the back of China's response to COVID have led to a very challenging economic outlook. The main focus in our economy forecast has been on inflation and the cost of living crisis for many, many households. We're forecasting inflation to peak at nearly 9% in the last quarter of this year as the October energy price cap increase comes in. We don't expect earnings to keep up with inflation, with a significant fall in real earnings of minus 2.7% this financial year before it returned to slow growth in future years. Since December, the funding the government receives from income tax after taking account of the block grant adjustment worsens this year and next before getting better for the remainder of the spending review. These later improvements are due to the UK government's promise to lower the income tax basic rate from 2024-25, which won't apply in Scotland, alongside our new baseline assumption of a frozen higher rate threshold in Scotland. I should add that although the Scottish Government understood this revised assumption, their income tax policies for next year won't be set until budget time. It's also worth knowing that the Scottish Government's funding comes under further strain in 2024-25 when they face a negative income tax reconciliation of over £800 million. This reconciliation is a result of two factors in the budget set in January 2021 when income tax revenues were based on our forecasts and the block grant adjustment for income tax on the OBR's forecasts from November 2020. If you cast your minds back to January 2021, there was a lot of uncertainty about the pandemic, but also about the state of the labour market with many people then on furlough. The forecast net position in 2021, in January 2021, benefited this government to the tune of £475 million. But we said then that we thought this was an artificial effect of forecast timing and uncertainty, which would result in a negative reconciliation later. Since then, we've revised up our forecast of Scottish income tax, but the OBR has increased its forecasts of UK government revenues even more. The result is the forecast large negative reconciliation. When the outturn data are available next summer in 2023, we'll know the exact size of the reconciliation. However, we can be confident that it will be negative and is likely to be large. The tax position is part of the, the Scottish Government's funding position and, of course, the size of the block grant from the UK Government is key. Overall, we're expecting total funding to drop slightly in real terms for the next three years before increasing slightly after that. Within this context, the Scottish Government has set its resource spending review. On the spending side, Social Security will account for an increasing share of the resource budget. This year, Social Security accounts for around 10%. By 2026-27, we expect it to have increased to around 14%. Since December, our forecasts of Social Security spending for 2026-27 have increased by nearly a billion pounds. This is because of higher inflation and Scottish Government policy announcements, such as the increase in the Scottish child payment to £25 per week and the plans to replace the devolved payments, which are still administered by DWP. Spending in future years is determined by policies the Scottish Government has already set in place and the commitments in the Social Security Charter. 
When our forecasts for Social Security spending are added to the government's own plans for health and social care spending, the funds left for other portfolios are very constrained. Once adjusted for inflation, funding for these other areas falls substantially for the first three years of the spending review is 8% below this year's levels by 25-26, and then in 26-27, funding is expected to be 5% below current levels in real terms. Now, I'd just like to finish with a short personal comment. As you know, this will be my last, this is my last forecast, as I'll be standing down from the Fiscal Commission at the end of this month. And I just want to say that it's been my genuine privilege to lead the Commission for these last eight years. And I have to confess, I've both welcomed and actually enjoyed our regular engagement with this committee and your predecessors. So I just wanted to say thank you. And now we'll take questions. Well, thank you very much for that. And I have to say, we'll be sorry to see you go. But um, I'm sure you just said that so we'll go easy on you for the next hour. But it's not going to happen, I'm sorry. Um, no, uh, not at all. Um, well, obviously, you, you touched on the key issues there that, that, that the committee will be asking about. And the first one really is inflation. Uh, I think one of the concerns about inflation is that the GDP deflator of about 2.4 per cent is not realistic relative to the retail price index. And I can see Professor Breeden uh, nodding at, at this time. So, I mean, obviously, we're going to be faced, and we are being faced, with a lot of public sector, understandable public sector pay demands. But first of all, can I ask, um, when you look at the, 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 the real reduction in, um, in uh, uh, disposable incomes uh, um, and, and, well, nominal earnings, we should say, I suppose, before we go on even to think about taxation and disposable income, when we look at the 2.7 per cent reduction, what's, is, there a, is, is there a differential you see between the private and public sectors in that? because um, that's the overall for the economy. But where, where would the private and public sector sit within that? Uh, you, you were <laughs> going to turn to Francis, who was nodding before. I was nodding the first part. The second part is more difficult in the yeah. sense we don't make that breakdown between public right. and private. Uh, but I do, do agree with your first point, is that government expenditure, you know, what's the real cost of government services is quite a difficult question to answer. And the, and the convention has been to use this thing called the GDP deflator which had a, well, has had, had a number of issues recently, but at the present time has a particular problem that it doesn't include import costs. And obviously import costs is at the heart of the cost of living problem. So for example, you know, the, the, the heating and lighting of this building you know, is, is really an import cost, but, but it's not measured, it's not covered in the, in the GDP deflator because it's, it's a, it's, that's only domestic production that's in there. So I think, so I think the takeaway from that is when we, there's real, reductions in government spending that uh, Susan was alluding to, in some sense, you, in your mind, you might think, actually, they're probably a little bit bigger because, you know, the, 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 the import costs are going to eat a lot of that, uh, that funding for, for government already before we start thinking of things like wage bills and, and other elements of the services. So I think that's the, 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 the slightly tricky point at the moment with looking at real falls in, in government expenditure. Yes, because I think if any employer was to say, for example, Cosler was to suggest, you know, that, um, you know, it's, it's to, was to say to um, unions, for example, all its local authorities um, were happy to provide um, workers with a 2.4% pay rise because that was a GDP deflate. In fact, they're not even offering that, I think. Um, then they're going to be in very difficult discussions straight away. So um, is perhaps this measure still an appropriate one to use in terms of forecasts? So um, it, it, it's difficult because uh, it, you know, measuring the price of government services is just very, very challenging. Even, even in the data, it's very challenging. You know, indeed, we've seen that in the pandemic. The, there is a thing called the price, you know, there's a uh, government expenditure deflator, which is specifically for government services. And we've seen that yo-yoing around because the pandemic has caused all sorts of like, you know, what's the value of education? You know, how much real education services were, were supplied over the pandemic? You know, we've seen that, that that measurement is really difficult. And so I think the convention that really has come from, you know, various uh, fiscal bodies to use the GDP deflator is a sort of compromise. It's one that, that is, it's the best, worst, you know, there, no, there's no good measure, but it's the best of the, of the bad measures. But I think, the, the, but as I said, the key point to think about in the current situation is one of its key weaknesses is, is that it doesn't include 
this import price inflation, which is which is obviously key at the current in the current environment, and that's why at the moment, in particular, it has a uh, has a problem. I don't think necessarily that means the consumer price deflator is a is a better one to use because actually that that has other problems, possibly too much import, you know, in, compared to what the government services are. So it's it's a, it's a very hard judgment to call which what's the right way to deflate government expenditure. Convener, forgive me for interrupting. I think Professor. Yes, Wolf I could see him something. champing at the bit yeah. there, <laughs> Professor. Wolf. I just want to say there's another dimension to this, which is what is the impact on public sector workers versus private sector workers of an average of 2.7 per cent fall in real incomes, and that, that will differ across the income distribution. So we know that, for example, the extent to which wage, wages and earnings are going up is somewhat lower for people lower down the distribution than for people higher up the distribution. Also, people lower down the distribution tend to be more reliant on energy and food in their consumption. So they're going to be hit harder in terms of the inflation that's hitting consumers. So in principle, you'd want to have a different uh, deflator for people at different parts of the income distribution. So the CPI measure of inflation is just a kind of average measure for the average consumer in the economy. It doesn't tell you what's happening to all these different consumers in the economy in terms of their real incomes. And you also have to take account of the fact that incomes might be growing at different rates across the sector. How that breaks down across the public sector versus the private sector is actually quite hard to, to work out. And we don't, we haven't gone into that issue in our forecasts. Okay, thank you. For that. I mean, I think we all realise how incredibly complex this this actually is, and it's, it's a tribute that you're able to produce forecasts as accurately as you as you do, uh, given these uh, issues. I mean, one of the things that, um, that that I think is concerning many people is as inflation goes up, even with increased pay rises, we we could end up with significant fiscal drag, and and and, and certainly in, in Figure Four, you talk about income. Uh, implied income uh, tax net position, and um, wh what do you believe that the impact will be in fiscal drag in terms of disposable income? Gosh, do you have? Uh, uh, not, not much. I mean, uh, so others can give more detail, but I think um, the uh, the key here is obviously, you know, earnings is where the tax revenue comes from, rather than inflation itself. And, and one of the key things about the inflation current... and earnings, sorry. Yes, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, but it's, but it's an important point because obviously that's the other feature of the current scenario, which is we've got a lot of inflation, we haven't got that much earnings, and therefore normally when you have a sort of old-fashioned inflation where earnings and earnings keeps track keeps up with inflation, you get a lot of fiscal drag where you get people dragged into higher tax bands. You get a lot of government revenue comes through that way. We're going to see less of that in this case because actually, although inflation is high, the earnings growth is not so high, so we're not going to see as much fiscal drag. But there is clearly some as we see people move into, into higher tax bands as, as earnings, uh, nominal earnings rise. Um, but as I say, I think the first point is to say fiscal drag is not as big a factor as is in a classic old-fashioned inflation where, where you're seeing both normal, you know, inflation and nominal earnings rise. So in that regard, the government's caught in a wee bit of a squeeze because fiscal drag is not bringing in as much money as, it, as, as one might yeah. anticipate because, of their, because pay isn't keeping up, but at the same time they're being faced with uh, significant pay demands. Exactly. And, and obviously on the other side, things like benefits, et cetera, are being uprated by inflation. So, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that there's negative fiscal drag, just, it's just not the big you know, bonus that it would be in a, in a sort of old-fashioned uh, inflationary scenario. Yes, Dame Susan, you think you want to Just a, a, a sort of thought on the side, which is um, inflation is very steep. We're, we're projecting it to be very steep by the end of this year. Uh, what really matters is less the actual number around inflation than whether it becomes entrenched or if it comes and then recedes. And that really is, is, is an important point to keep in mind. Yes, I, absolutely. I mean, I, I fully appreciate, you know, that, uh, you know, that in your... Um, um, in your report, you, you talk about the, uh, how you expect uh, inflation to actually get back to kind of, you know, uh, around about 2%. And, and uh, obviously, once oil prices, for example, have jumped by a high level and if they don't increase anymore, then obviously the following year there will be zero inflation in oil if the price stays the same. 
clearly, because you've already had that big yeah. increase. Yeah. So there's a platforming there. So I do appreciate, appreciate that uh, you expect long, long run inflation to actually go back to not, not so much like in the 70, 90, 82 phase when we had that for uh, 20, 70, 30 per cent for, for, for two or three years. Um, going back to taxation, though, um, we, uh, I think, have an understanding of this quite well. But for the record, I'd be quite interested in, in uh, the Commission putting, uh, putting on the, the, uh, um, outlining um, the statement that from 24-25, the UK Government intends to reduce the basic rate of income tax to 19 per cent. The income tax block grant adjustment will reduce accordingly, thus supporting next Scottish income tax uh, funding. So I'm just wondering if you can perhaps touch on that. Just for the, the record, please. Do you, David, do you... Well, well, the block grant adjustment is there to reflect what would have happened to taxation had Scotland been part of the UK tax system. So if the UK government cuts the basic rate of tax to 19p, then had Scotland been part of the UK tax system, the tax rate would have come down in Scotland as well, and last tax revenue would have been raised. So What's happening because of that is the block grant is not being reduced by as much as it would have been done had the government kept, UK government kept the tax rate at 20 per cent. So the fact that the block grant has been adjusted by less or cut by less means that the net tax position in Scotland is stronger because of that. So that's why we're forecasting an improvement in the net tax position in Scotland because of the reduction in the basic rate in the UK. Okay. Team Susan. Community, there's another side to that equation as well, which is our base assumption, which we've described, that in Scotland, the higher um, tax rate, um, where we have now made an assumption that it doesn't go up each year with inflation, but that the threshold will stay the same. And that means that um, over time, if that assumption you know, bears out, more people will go into that threshold that will also increase. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's a question we would probably want to ask of the Cabinet Secretary, but I think she'll take the fifth prior to budget deliberations on that one, uh, to be honest. Just one more question for me, because colleagues do want to uh, come in, and that's the issue of the assumption of future Barnet consequentials beyond the core block grant based on analysis of historic data, and that's in page 18 of the medium-term financial strategy, which assumes £250 million next year, uh, assumed future consequentials, and £400 million after that. So, in paragraph 32 of your own uh, document, basically, you talk about £250 million rising to £591 million, actually, to 2026-27, which is £191 million more than is in the MTFS. So I'm just wondering if you can talk about that. And also, if you can just talk about um, how the Scottish Government fared in terms of its assumption that £620 million, of pounds, which the committee deliberated over quite considerably, um, d uh, but whether that did actually uh, um, come forward or how much of it did. So there, there's a lot in that question. John, did you locate... Um, I'm not yet. <coughs> I'm, I'm still looking. Oh, OK. Um, I'm going to take a second question. We have been tracking this quite carefully. We know that roughly half of that has come in through block grant adjustments that have arisen from two fiscal events that have already taken place. Um, we know that the Scotland, which had previously been factored in to the 620 million, is no longer going to be used for that. That's going to be used for other uh, fiscal issues. Um, so that's come out of the equation. There is still the issue about reconciliations, and that still remains open. We don't have a final determination on what's happening there. So the, the position we've taken is that we still think of the, the, our judgment is that it is broadly reasonable to assume that the remaining part of the 620 billion will still come in. There do seem to be enough other sources of income out there that could potentially generate the money that hasn't already come in for that six twenty million. But we are continuing to monitor. Just to say, I think that you, you said reconciliations, you meant, you meant spillovers, I think. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. yeah. 
So there is the, the spillover dispute, which is, is ongoing. Something is expected from that. Um, and uh, UK main estimates, there are consequentials from that. So there are, there are elements. It's a little bit different from what made up the 620 number in mm -hmm. December. Um, but uh, we still think that there is an, enough there, potentially. Okay, and just why is your 591 million different from the Scottish Government's 400 million in terms of that figure? So I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure where are you. I'm just comparing the the, the, the MTFS with the, with the, your own um, forecasting document because the 250 million is exactly the same as what the Scottish Government have said, but you've put 591 million to 2026-27, whereas they just have 400 million in 24-25 for that. So I think we're doing that over a longer, a longer time period. So um, from my reading of the table, um, we just produced the, the whole of... The, they, they, the Government have made different assumptions for each different financial year about the bonnet consequentials on, on top. Um, but I haven't got a comparison with the MTFS. Perhaps if we could just write to you with an explanation. Yeah, yeah. I'm, just, I'm just wondering why the, the Scottish Government haven't included these figures, but you have. That was, that was all, because there's a 191 million I pound difference. I think what we were trying to do, in a sense, was just unpack their assumptions. I think mm. what they've done is they, they've compressed a fair amount of detail in this sort of other category. And we've tr we, what we've tried to do is just expand that and make it consistent with what we produced in, in the budget. Um, documentation. Uh -huh. So I think that probably explains why we've got a little bit more detail here. Um, but I can certainly have a look at that and compare it with MTRS and get back to you. Okay, thank you very much. Daniel, to be followed by Michelle. I mean, just following directly on, I mean, on, on the point about future Barnett consequentials, I mean, are, are you confident that the, that, 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 that the government's approach is sufficiently robust? I mean, it sounds almost like they're, they're being too, too, too granular and therefore that, that, you know, there's quite a, a, a large contingency on those four class consequentials in future years. Is, is, that, is, is that the position the Commission is taking or is that the, the fear that the Commission has? I, th I think the, the position that in possibly the wording we use is that we think what the approach they've taken is reasonable. Um, obviously, we're talking about forecasts here, and we don't know what those will be, but it is probably a wise thing to have taken a look over the period of the resource spending review um, so that there is a kind of baseline based on our tax and our, our funding and our spending forecasts now. Um, the, the government has basically outlined how it would achieve its balanced budget that it's required to have in each of the years of the spending review. If funding changes, I mean, these numbers will always change, as you know, over time, they then can make decisions based on that rather more um, it's sort, of, uh, sort of known platform that they're starting out with now. But to say that, you know, do we think the, the number and the consequentials is exactly right, really hard, and the further you yeah. go out, the, the harder it is to confirm that. But could I make John? Add that we did have extensive discussions with economists and the, the Scottish Government about this, and we probed quite forensically what their assumptions were. We also did our own independent analysis of potential future consequentials. And we may have presented some of their findings in a different way that we thought was a better way of presenting them. But we, the numbers were the same, we've just presented them in, in different okay. ways. But our independent analysis also suggested that their assumptions about future consequentials were broadly reasonable okay. assumptions. That's they could be backed up. John? No, I, I was just going to say that you can, perhaps it's worth just unpacking it a little bit. The, there are two sets of numbers floating around here. There's the sort of the baseline, the Barnet baseline, which is the substantive amount of money you know, um, by the end, about 39 billion. And in a sense, we're, we're sort of confident about that. You know, the first couple of years were taken from the, the UK government spending review, and the second part of that, the government took from OBR projections of resource expenditure and applied the growth rates in the OBR to the Scottish baseline. So we're reasonably confident about that, sort of more than reasonably confident, confident about that <clears throat> very large 39 billion component. And then the, the other part of this, um, which we were talking about before, is the bonnet consequential line underneath, which is about, by the end, of point, point 0.6 billion. And that's where I think David's sort of points and Susan's about sort of, well, we've done our own analysis and, you know, we're broadly comfortable um, sort of apply. So I think just having that dif dif 
distinction between those two different lines on the table is important. Yeah, I appreciate. I understood that, but it's a useful clarification. I guess the danger is that you you fall into the trap of going, well, we've always had these extra consequentials and, and we expect them to happen again in the future. Um, so I, I take that point. Just on the difference between kind of OBR growth and, and uh, the, the, the forecast growth we have in Scotland, I just really want to, 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 to unpack um, what, what is contained within your forecast. Um, you know, in particular, when we look at um, the... the um, it, we, we've got a, quite not, well, we have to change. So I understand the points around both um, the, the holding the thresholds uh, uh, rather than inflating them, and I understand the point around uh, the 19 pence decision futures at UK level. But if you strip those out, it would appear that since December, that the, the uh, Commission's forecast for earnings growth in Scotland has actually deteriorated. Um, uh, uh, and it certainly, it certainly is very clear that the earnings growth is slower in Scotland than the rest of the UK. Uh, I, I, I'm just wondering if you could provide any insight into kind of what changes have occurred since December um, uh, uh, you know, and, and what, you know, what the, like, the consequences are. Maybe just on a, on a broad level, and my colleagues would then come in, um, if you're looking just at GDP since, since December, um, the um, sort of slowing of the oil and gas sector um, impacts Scotland and Scotland's GDP. Um, in, uh, particularly in the London area, um, the buoyancy in earnings, particularly in financial services, this year, um, has been quite marked compared to the last few years. And so that creates a, a bit of a bifurcation in terms of uh, GDP growth. Francis? Um, yeah, just so, so a couple of things. The, I mean, I'm sure you've heard us talk about RTI data, uh, you know, regulate the committee. The, you know, the, the, the sort of almost real time data is pointing exactly as you say that the, Scotland has not uh, kept up with the rest of the UK over that. Uh, period uh, for reasons that are, you know, well, really mainly related to what Susan has just said. Um, the other thing to say, though, looking forward is a big part of the fall in total earnings is, is, a, is a relatively slow growth in employment in, um, in Scotland versus the rest of the UK. So it's not that, uh, that average earnings, I mean, there is an element of slower growth in average earnings, but actually I think I'm right to say that of the two, the, the, the employment, the, the growth right. in employment is the, is the bigger element of what's of that slowdown you see in the first two years. Yeah. And just to clarify, my, my, my assumption was drawn from figure 3.17, where we see the, the teal line, which is your latest forecast, being significantly lower between 21, 22, and 23, 24 than, yeah. the, than the, the yellow line, which was your December forecast. Um, but just coming back to the source of them, and I think we all understand the, 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 the underlying issues with the North East and the oil and gas, but in your previous forecast in December, you showed, uh, had quite a detailed regional breakdown, and it showed actually that trend was also apparent uh, in the southeast of, of Scotland, which you might have expected, might have uh, you know, not, not, not be in the same dynamic, indeed might have actually benefited from some of the same things that have benefited the southeast in terms of the, the financial services uh, industry. I'm just wondering, you know, has that regional analysis been carried out by the Fiscal Commission? What, what, and what does that show? And indeed, what, what are the, you know, why are we seeing all the regions in Scotland suffer that lag? Because uh, it, it seems to be more pervasive than just the North East. So specifically on, on finance, sorry. Um, the, I mean, I think you're right. It, it's slightly more surprising given there's finance in, in, in both London and uh, and, and so the, I think the, the nature, what we're, you know, we're still looking into this, but, but what the, the nature of the finance industry is different, and in particular the, you know, the very the large bonuses related to sort of portfolio management uh, industries like hedge funds and others, you know, that, that really drove the London earnings, and that's not such a big part of the uh, of the Scottish financial services, which does more uh, in other areas. So although that's tentative, because when you get down to that level of granularity, you're really, you know, you, 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 you're stretching the data to its limits. But I think that was our feeling as what had happened here was that there was a, a, a particular bonus to um, to the, the financial services in which London focuses on, rather than other areas of the UK. Yeah. Could I just add that box 3.2 in the main report actually repeats that analysis 
Um, and it takes a little bit further in, it, it looks at growth in RTI um, pay since 2016, 17 by region as well. So there's a nice map which sort of summarizes all of that. Yeah, Th thank you. Um, following on from that, I mean, obviously the, what underpins fundamentally earnings uh, growth and employment growth is, is uh, productivity growth. Uh, and again, looking at figure 3.13, um, uh, 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 you, know, you see a, a, a trend of downwards since uh, 2010 in terms of uh, productivity growth. Indeed, you stated it quite starkly in paragraph 3.39 that productivity growth has stalled since 2015. Um, I, I mean, I, I, first of all, I assume that that is largely, and it seems to be what you're saying in the report, tied to falling investment levels in oil and gas. But, my, but more fundamentally, it there, there seems to be an inflection point that you imply around uh, well, 20, well, this financial year where we'll start to see productivity growth growing again in Scotland. And, I, and I, 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 I'm just wondering what lies behind that assumption, because it almost gives us a bit of a hockey stick, which I always am I'm slightly concerned about when I see, especially in forecasts rather than retrospective. <laughs> Well, I think some of the, the, the growth in productivity is simply people getting back into jobs and there being quite high levels of demand to sustain quite a lot of production there. What we're worried about over the medium term, the next couple of years, is we're seeing all these pressures in the labour market where some sectors are really struggling to get hold of workers. We've seen that with airlines and airports over the last few days. So there's a sense out there that while the total amount of labour is probably okay, they're all in the wrong places, they're in the wrong industries and the wrong places. Uh -huh. So until the economy sorts that problem out over the next couple of years, there will be issues there about the levels of output and the levels of productivity that can be sustained by the workforce. Um, but that's not a problem peculiar to Scotland. That, that's a problem across the rest of the UK, but in, a, in other parts of the world as well. Thank you. Could, I'll just want to ask one final question. Uh, uh, just relating back to one of the, the questions Kavina asked in your answer about what's likely to happen with inflation in future years. The Kavina made a comparison with the late 70s, early 80s. Is the, is, Am I right to infer that the fundamental difference is that we have a much more globalised economy and therefore the things which are rising in costs, that spend is not being cycled back around our economy, it's going to other, other parts of the world, whereas back then in a much more isolated economy that would have fed back around and, and therefore given headroom for earnings to grow and, and simply because that, those revenues are going elsewhere in the world particularly China, that is going to dampen inflationary impacts? Or am I, am I doing too much amateur uh, 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 economic theory uh, in that statement? Could I just make, maybe make um, one point about what we have said about inflation? Yeah. So, um, and, and it's already been repeated here that it will be very high, and then starting next year we'll begin to come back to the Bank of England's um, target of 2%. That, we looked at that very carefully as we were closing out our um, uh, forecasts and felt that that was still a proper assumption to be our central assumption in the forecast. But we do, and, and we've noted, um, an in downsides, uh, downside risk, uh, increasingly so, that inflation would last longer. Um, and I think that's what, what this question is about. So that is certainly a risk. We're not saying that that could not happen. But our forecasts right now um, assume that our um, central case will be will be the case, but it doesn't answer your question directly, but I just wanted to be clear that it, it, you know, we've, it's not that we've had blinders on and have not looked at the possibility of worsening inflation. The one thing to add is that some of the inflation we're suffering from at the moment is imported inflation. Yeah. It's because of things like rising energy prices, Indeed. because the gas market that other consumers want to buy into is driving up the price there and also the shortages of component parts coming out from China because of the lockdown uh, of COVID in China, that's going to have knock-on effects on inflation 
as well. So it's, it's, it's quite difficult to work out how far where some of our demand is driving up prices elsewhere and how much is domestic and demand yeah. is driving up domestic. So, so I guess it's a question whether this is a, a correction or an ongoing cycle fundamentally. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I think, yeah, so you're, you're right, this is a, a different character of inflation. This is my question often because I'm always saying this in terms of trade shock where we, we're seeing it in the price of imports relative to what we exports, which basically means, sadly, we need to end up this, this situation as a poorer country than we ended into it because we have to pay more money to, to, to overseas to, for the stuff that we require. I think the point is that this is not the first time this has happened. I mean, in a sense, you know, the, the 80s and 70s and 80s, we went through exactly the same Routine. So what is somewhat different now, and this is really, I think, what you, you're driving at, is um, partly due to globalisation, partly due to very anchored inflation expectations. It's not, it doesn't feel like the beginning of an old-fashioned wage price spiral, which we, would have, which we saw in the previous oil price shocks, uh, partly, let's say, because, A, because um, uh, the, the, the labour force, in a sense, is global rather than just country level, but also because, as I say, we've had such a long period of low inflation It'll take us a while to get back into that habit of, you know, you know trying to claw back uh, uh, if surprise inflation each time. So, but it clearly, we and all other forecasters are at the moment making that as an assumption that, that, that this will be a one-off. This won't lead to a, to that sort of tr attempt to claw back the the, the um, higher inflation and higher wages. Um, and that's, uh, and, and I mean, I think I could probably su suggest. I think you're probably right to say the fact that all in forecasters have made roughly the same judgment as us doesn't necessarily mean it's the right judgment. It just means that we've all, we've all made the same judgment. It's, uh... Thank you. OK, thank you. Michelle, to be followed by Joan. Well, actually, um, I, I was going to raise some similar questions to Daniel about your, I suppose, how confident you are, accepting what you've said, uh, Professor Breeden, about everyone else made the same prediction, because you know, you, you estimate it will peak at 8.7 in the last quarter of this year, but when you read more detail and some of the uncertainties that you point out in the supply side that we've got much less understanding about, I suppose my question to you is, realistically, how confident... I mean, we know it will probably be wrong because all these things are wrong, and I fully accept that, but it's more the kind of confidence level because it seems to me, you know, when you, you read what Andrew Bailey was saying recently in conceding that the, the fiscal levers he has to exert control, he concedes, are fairly limited over CPI uh, inflation. And I just, I just you, obviously it's always uncertain, but how uncertain? And if I asked you to place a wager of your own personal money, say £500, how much of that money would you risk? Perhaps that's a better way to put it. <laughs> we should just go right down the thing. <laughs> David, how much would you risk? My checking partner. <laughs> um, I think the issue is that there are two components we're talking about, as Susan referred to earlier. There's a question of what's the level to which inflation could get, and there's a question of how prolonged inflation we get. Um, one problem is that inflation is quite volatile. It depends on whether you're looking at the monthly inflation rates, quarterly inflation rates, or annual inflation rates. So we could be out a little bit on that just because there is a spike in, in one of the monthly levels of inflation. It comes back to this question of how confident are we that inflation will drop significantly back down towards the 2% level. That is where I think the greatest uncertainty lies. And it is a, a question about how embedded inflation gets. First of all, whether there are other sources of shortages which might emerge over the next year or so that we haven't been aware of. But it goes back to the point that France has made us. At the moment, it does seem to be the case that because we've had many, many decades now of quite low inflation, inflation expectations are anchored at quite a low level. So there's not the same spirit back in the 70s and 80s that as soon as prices start going up, you immediately go out and need to get higher, higher wages. There's a, a recognition that wages might not always go up necessarily at the rate at which prices are, are going up. So that anchoring of inflationary expectations could still hold inflation down a little bit. 
Uh, and then it goes back to the arithmetical point that our chair mentioned that inflation is about the weight of increase in prices. So even if the oil prices stay high, the inflation is still going to go down because they're not going to carry on mm, rising. Convenient. And so that is one of the reasons why we think inflation will come down, is that we don't see the obvious forces that are going to carry on driving them up. It doesn't mean we think prices will go down. It means we think prices will probably stay high, and that will still have impacts on cost of living. But the forces driving them up, we don't quite see where they are. The other element, I think, on the periphery is that um, the Chancellor has put some money on the table over the spring in the most recent um, packet of money in late May, um, particularly benefits lower income households um, and should for this year, so this is a one-off for this year, um, keep those households relatively okay in terms of the increase in cost of living. And it's something we're very cognizant of is that we're talking at the end of the day about households and people and communities here. Um, but if, if those households in general um, are not suffering from that cost of living crisis because of this one-off grant, and some will actually be better off. Um, that also creates less pressure to uh, just pump wages up more and more. And, and you know, you, you put all these factors together. So it, that's also why we thought that it is at least still reasonable to think that inflation might not last all that long. Okay, so I'll collect your £500 from all four of you at the end of this session then. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, my, my other question then, and I'm just not quite uh, clear um, where and how you baked the impact of Brexit into all your forecasts. Uh, now, I assume you've done a similar thing. You've reflected all the way through the kind of hangover from the pandemic and some of the supply issues that we've talked about that have reverberated around the world. But I'm just not clear, and I suppose, to be honest, I was sort of slightly surprised that there wasn't any mention of it, given that we know, we know now that the impacts are only starting to be felt, even though I appreciate that it's complex to pin Brexit on one thing because it's a very it's a, a very fragmented picture. But I just was surprised that there was no mention of it. And so what and how have you baked it into all the numbers is my question. Well I think the answer is that we it is baked in. Yeah. It is now part of the baseline assumption in the economy. So for quite a number of years we were talking explicitly about Brexit and how it was impacting our forecast. But it's now it's now in there as baked into the forecast of what's going to be happening to the economy. I, I said that there might be some subtleties about how far is Brexit driving some of these inflation stories we're, we're talking about. Um, and it's just too early to disentangle the effects mm -hmm. of Brexit from all the other factors that are driving that. And is but, that similarly to what you've done with uh, the pandemic then, is that the same approach it's, you've it's taken? Broadly, it's in there already. It's there. Yeah. Okay, okay. So I think, I mean, just to we begin to observe the Brexit effects being different from what we obviously baked into the forecast. We'll, we'll make an adjustment at that point at the moment. It really is too early for us to, to, to make a judgment that, that our original judgment was incorrect. So we're still running with our original judgment of, of the impact of Brexit. OK. <laughs> OK, thank you very much. OK, thank you. John, to be followed by Douglas. Uh, thanks, uh, convener, very much. Just, I think, a few things for myself. Can I first of all say how much I've appreciated working with uh, Dame Susan Rice over the years? I think I was on this committee before the Fiscal Commission was set up and was involved in the process. Uh, so it's been a long-running uh, relationship with the Commission and yourself personally. So I have very much appreciated that, for one. Um, yeah, I mean, we've spent quite a lot of time on inflation. On, on Social Security, clearly the, the, the numbers are going up quite dramatically. Um, and it, it's often been said that if we give more money to people who are less well off, that will boost the economy more as a kind of secondary effect, um, because they will spend it here in local shops on local goods and services, whereas if people who are better off have more money, they may spend it abroad or, or on other things. Is that, does that secondary effect come into the forecasts? or? Can we not really go that far? So some of the a lot of the growth in the Social Security benefits uh, relates to how much more the Scottish government needs to fund for those benefits beyond the um, 
amount that comes from Westminster uh, for the original shape of benefits, and that comes with opening the benefits up um, it, it, in various ways in terms of eligibility, in terms of um, you know length of time on a benefit. But one of the things that now kicks in uh, in a significant way is that not all, but I think a majority of the benefits move up with uh, inflation. So, so all, I think there are a suite of disability benefits. The adult disability disability benefit is the is the big one in in number terms, um, but these will increase with inflation. So some of that growth is is for that reason. Um, the government's focus on child poverty has led to expanding the. Um, population or the age range of children who would, um, whose families would earn that payment, and the payment, which was moving up earlier this year to 20 pounds a week, is now at 25 pounds. So the the growth there is because the um, actual benefits are uh, really significantly different, as well as growing with inflation. Okay, so. As the next step, I mean, does it matter for, from the economy's point of view whether the Scottish Government, which clearly is the focus, is putting the money into Social Security and therefore is going to a certain group's pockets and on, or, you know, say compared to Scottish Enterprise and then it might be going to international companies. You, does that make any difference to the economy? I mean, uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, to a small degree. You're, so you're, you're exactly right that, you know, if you give money to, to people with high propensity to spend, then clearly that money will quickly re-enter the economy more so than if you give it to somebody with a very high propensity to save. So, so that effect is there. Uh, I, I think, well, we don't track it directly. And, and I think overall it is relatively weak because it's very much a second round because we're not, you know, this, the people who receive these benefits are not going to be paying more income tax themselves. It's the people who, you know, the, the shops they go into and spend and the incomes of the people who work in those shops that might go up, you know. So it is a very second round effect. And so I think uh, we haven't explicitly modelled it, but, I would, but I would, my guess is it is a relatively small effect. Right. But the other point to make is that you're talking about the economy. The economy is more than just the aggregate or the average economy. The economy is also about the distribution yes. of well-being across individuals. And Social Security certainly plays a role in giving you a different distribution of well-being across individuals than you would have got had you not had those programmes in place. Yes. No, absolutely. Yes. No, that's a key point. Um, the, the £817 million reconciliation sounds quite scary, um, but, but we previously had quite a large reconciliation we thought was coming along, and it turned out not to be quite as bad. So th should that make me hopeful that, again, things will improve, or is it very different this time? I think the answer is we really don't know, because the numbers that will actually define and make specific that reconciliation will be the outturn numbers yes. that uh, come out in the summer of 2023, 16 months uh, after a budget is when we see the income tax yes. outturn numbers, so we don't know. Because I think last time I was right in saying it was even at the end of the year in question, we were still forecasting a more pessimistic position than it actually turned out. So it is quite hard to know it in advance. It's hard to know. No. Yeah. Could I <clears throat> just add it that there are two components to, to this. There's the repairs you earn component, and for the 870, 870 million reconciliation, we're, we're talking about taxes collected in 21-22. So we actually have real-time data, which comes in every quarter, on, on the sort of the pairs you earn element. So we can be reasonably sure about that component as we, as we get towards the end of the 2021-22 yeah, financial year, as we pass that point. The difficulty is self-assessment, and, and that we just don't know about. Right. So I think, I think we, we do know some stuff, but we, and we know, and, and pay as is bigger than self-assessment, but we don't know the self-assessment the self stuff. And, that's, and that could move quite a lot, and yeah, so it may be as bad, it may be worse. It, be Would that be because, I mean, from year to year it can change quite a lot, people who are self-employed as compared to people who are employed and, and that yeah, balance? I think that for sure, but also 21, 20, sorry, um, 21 22 is the tail end of the pandemic and funny things are going on with self-employment because of the furlough as well. So, you know, it, it genuinely is, yeah, a big no, that's fair enough. question mark. Thanks. The thing about self-employment is that for very, very high earners, that's often driven by bonuses in the city and those are inherently hard to forecast. Uh, we have had high levels of bonuses 
this year, but that that can change from year to year. So that's that's the bit that's quite hard to forecast. I think we're pretty confident that the reconciliation will be negative. It's, yes. It's not going to suddenly become positive again. But it, whether it's 600 million or 900 million, that's where it's harder to, yes. to be confident. I, I think that's a, a key point. Going back to your original question is, it could be worse. I mean, it's, <laughs> so it's, you know, so don't say, say, you know, oh well, you know, because it's uncertain, maybe it'll be good news. I mean, it, uh, sadly, it could be, because it's uncertain, it may be even worse news. That you know, so that's what I think. That, right. you know, there's a depressing message to keep in mind. Okay, I thought I was <laughs> pessimistic, but that kind of, uh, <laughs> underlines it more. Uh, and, and the final thing I just wanted to ask you: I think there was a suggestion that you were going to investigate further the kind of slower employment growth in Scotland compared to the UK. Is that correct? Can you can you just expand on? what you're going to be doing? Well, <laughs> I mean, we, we continue to, to, to look at it. Um, and there was a chart, one of you referred to figure 3.13. This isn't something we did for that purpose. But if you look at, um, it's the demographic point we've made at this committee over the years, that we have a population that is getting older and therefore coming out of employment. Um, but what we don't have is the replacement. If you look at the kind of 16 to 25 year olds, people who might be going into employment, that's a smaller group. And it's that it's not just at the upper end of the age uh, range, it's actually filling in uh, the workforce from from down below, but I'll turn to colleagues. Yeah, the issue here is the participation rate amongst younger workers. Um, it just seems to be lower in Scotland and has been falling for a while. And to be honest, we don't quite know precisely what that is. Obviously, one component of that is people going into education and delaying going into the, the labour market. That's one reason why you might have low participation. And it may be that if people are perceiving greater uncertainty in the future, they feel they'd better get more and more qualifications. So that could be part of the, the story. We wouldn't quite explain why that would be different between Scotland and the rest of the UK. But that's something which we are going to look into in more detail. It's quite hard to get all the data you need to do that. Yeah. Sorry, I was just saying, a key point is, you know, is this a one-off and, you know, things will go back to normal like, in future years, or is this a secular trend? And obviously, the, you know, the difference between those two outcomes is hugely important for the Scottish economy. And that's the question we really, I'm not sure we'll get to the answer to, but that's the question we're trying to dig down to, whether there's something going on that is of a long-term consequences, which then has big implications for the sustainability of the Scottish finances in the long term, or is it just a one-off that we will look back on and scratch our heads about in, you know, in a few years' time, but it, it already has stopped? Because presumably the life expectancy would be part of that equation in that that affects the proportion of the population that's actually yeah. working and so yeah. on. And that seems to be in a UK-wide issue, yeah. is a life expectancy. Yeah, no, exactly. I think, I think the demographics, you know, we, we can, obviously, you can project those forward very, with relatively high level of confidence. It's, as, as David was saying, this issue of participation amongst younger people is the one where we are sort of really scratching our heads about, and, and that but is a very important question to get to the bottom of. Okay. That's great. Thanks. Thanks, Camina. OK, thank you, John. Douglas, who followed by Liz. Okay, thanks, Camina. Um, just wanted to ask about the 620 million pot again. Um, I'm, I'm sort of quite new to this. I'm still trying to get my head around it. But so, do we know how much Scotland was going to be contribute, contributing to that 620 million at the start of the, the year? Should ask um, the cabinet secretary. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it, it, it just, uh, you know, I struggle to see where the transparency is around that 620 million. When you know, you know, I, I don't know how you can, you know, almost approve it or say it's it, it's okay if you don't know what's going to be in it yourselves. Mm. We had some conversations with government officials, but they were inconfident. So I mean, okay, I think the best thing is to ask the cabinet secretary about the components. Right. Of the 620. But I guess from my point of view, I'm trying to think that could, well could have been higher at the start of the year. You know, as well as MSPs, if, we, we, if I was to say oh, I want, I think we should spend another 50 million on child poverty, for example. You know, I would have to say where that money is going to come from. So I guess. You know, uh, can I just say at any time, well, just make that 620, 670? You know, how, is there a flexibility that that can go up to as well, just like the other forecasts? I think the, what's important to think about here is that I think from, you know, 
very early days of the Scottish budget, budget, there's always a degree to which there's an additional lump of money, and there have been various conversations about it in this committee, mm -hmm. and people referring to it as you know, like hidden behind sofas and things like that. But what's happened over the past couple of years, three years or so, um, is that the government has been much more transparent about the, the size of that um, and what goes into it, and we've certainly been pressing the government on that quite a lot. And you can see that in the, you know, in the current report, again, there's more transparency than previously. So, for example, we now know that um, there's about £660 million worth of Scotland money, which is going to be drawn down in the first two years of the resource, you know, the spending review mm -hmm. period. So, if you think about that, you know, you've got that commitment about 670. If you dig around on the Crown Estate website, you can find a sort of a rough indication of how much money they were thinking would come from Scotland. So, you know, it, it's reasonable to assume that most of that sort of Scotland money is actually in the in, in resource spending in the future. So, you know, from that, you can infer something about what happened in the past. Mm -hmm. But I think. My going much beyond that is probably not, not okay. proper, so I think that is something for the council. But, but I am, I'm right in thinking that. It's not easy to, to work out then what, what constitutes that 620 million at the I think we, 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 were, we, we were given a reasonable story about that, which you know, after some probing we, we, we judged to be as reasonable. Mm -hmm. But I think, the, you know, I think the thing that we're trying to work for is, is, is much more transparency. And I, yeah. think, you know, I think you do have to credit the government with sort of moving a massive distance from the position they were you know, five years ago to where they are now, mm -hmm. where you know, it actually goes into documentation, there's a, a degree of narrative, and they tell us stuff as well. Mm -hmm. And I think this year, you know, that, that, that transparency has increased as well. So I think you know, the government's moving in, in very much the right direction to improve transparency. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, guess, I guess they are, but um, it still worries me that you know, there's money comes out of that 620 million, for Scotland, for example, and then magically there's just other things appear that make that figure still achievable. So I think we've already had it once already, I think it was to do with um, COVID recovery money, and now we've got it with, with, with Scotland. So, yeah, it, was, it will be something I ask uh, the Cabinet Secretary. Um, other question I had was around non-domestic rates. Now, in the, in, in the table, you know, we see it going up from $2.7 um, billion to $3.3 billion next year. Now, some of that will be because there was COVID um, relief funding um, coming through for retail, hospitality and leisure but it's still a 20% increase. Was there any, any narrative around you know, why it would be increasing by, by so much? And then it also increases by 9.8% between 25 and 26. Any detail around that? Well, one thing we have done is to revise down some of our forecasts for NDR because of appeals losses. We, we had assumed a certain level of appeals losses that would materialise over a period of time. But we were getting to a position where that limit was already being hit. And so we thought, reasonably, in the future, we're going to have even more appeals losses. And so we've revised down the amount of NDR that's going to be collected over the next few years because of those uh, appeals losses. Yeah, but it's gone up, it's gone up by 20%. Yeah, so yeah. Um, if you look at, I think, figure 4.17 in the report, it sort of breaks down the, the change in the forecast between December and May. As you go out, um, more of that increase is basically due to inflation. So um, there's a total increase, total change of 26, 27, of about 132 million since the December forecast, and 136 of that has been because of inflation. So inflation is the main driver towards the end of the forecast of increases. In okay, NDR. so it's, it's not really growth, because we can see the growth is quite, quite flat, it is going to be the businesses we have paid more because of inflation coming through yeah. affecting their, yeah. their, and their that, bills. And underlying that, of course, is an assumption about the poundage. So we're assuming that the poundage basically goes up with inflation. But if you look at how the poundage has actually moved, you know, it tends to be just a little under inflation. So you know, there, may, there may be a little bit of difference because of that. Mm -hmm. And then I guess for you know, three years' time, when it goes up by another 10%, I guess that will be around revaluation time, I guess, or is there something else maybe yeah, happening? Revaluation, revaluation is a, a sort of factor there, but I think what we've done on revaluation, because you know, there are lots of sort of rumours at the moment, but I think on balance we, we just don't think there's enough information to sort of say where revaluation is going to go. So we made a pretty neutral assumption around revaluation. Mm -hmm. But it's still gone up by 9.8% on my 
Um, again, you know, um, just looking at the table and um, the table, we've got, we've got changes um, since the December forecast. Um, in a couple of years' time, that is again still principally due to inflation. Um, and I was just trying to do that thing that you've been doing in your head as well. Um, <laughs> but my hunch is there that the, the, the principal driver, as you, you know, the second half of the forecast is around inflation. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, list to be followed by Ross. Uh, thank you. Um, could I ask very specific questions about where, as forecasters, you think there is the best potential for improvement in productivity and economic growth? Because obviously that's the bottom line in terms of trying to improve uh, the uh, Scottish economy for the future. And I know you can't set policies at all and won't comment on that. But how easy is it for you as statisticians and people who are analysing the various trends within the economy to spot where you feel there is the best potential for improving productivity and economic growth within the current setup? Well, as, as forecasters, that does go quite beyond our, our remit. The, the general drivers of productivity, first of all, you have to realise that there's different definitions of productivity. There's, productivity in terms of output per head, but there are much wider definitions of productivity as well. And so partly it depends on which measure of productivity you're talking about. A general driver of productivity is when things are becoming very expensive and people find ways of doing them in alternative ways. Um, so if, for example, you find that shortage of people to pick fruit is causing a real problem to the fruit industry. Well, I was, there was an article last week about some really sophisticated yeah. automatic fruit prickers that people have developed. Now, if those were developed in Scotland, and if Scotland could then sell the intellectual property rights around the world and capitalise on that discovery, that would bring a lot of income to Scotland and it would increase productivity because with the existing workforce, you could pick far more fruit than you would do otherwise. But so those are the normal sources of productivity growth. It comes from technological improvements, technological innovation, driven by the need to overcome problems and shortages you, you find in the economy. Some of your recent analysis has uh, highlighted the fact that there are issues regarding uh, the uh, tax revenues from uh, the North East and the fact that some of the uh, labour market there may well change as a result of just transition and um, changes within the structure of the economy. Is it uh, within your ability to uh, set out where you think the greatest impact of these uh, changes to tax revenues could be uh, in, in the future, or is that something that you would not, not do and let government do that? I, I just see tax revenues as absolutely critical, and you've said this yourself in several uh, consecutive reports, that, tax re that the tax revenue is absolutely critical yep. in terms of how well the Scottish economy can perform. And I'm just interested to know um, how easy it is for a government to set policy on the basis of your... Um, interpretation of that. Uh, well, I, think about, I was going to add slightly <laughs> field comment, which is uh, so I, I, in some of my research, I look at small economies, which Scotland isn't, but it's close to them, particularly I've done a lot of work in Iceland. And one of the things that is noticeable in small economies is the importance of actually sort of softer areas of where productivity growth comes from, particularly areas like social capital, social cohesion. Um, you know, that I, if you look at the economics of a country like Iceland, they look awful. You know, it's a, it's a tiny cold island in the middle of nowhere, you know, and it, uh, with, with about three trees. You know, it really doesn't have much going for it. But it has been a very successful economy. And one of the key reasons, a very productive economy, one of the key reasons is that there's a very strong, you know, identity amongst the people. There's a very strong uh, social cohesion in that country. So I think it's not all, I mean, clearly, you know, in, in our role here at the Fiscal Mission, we have a very fiscal and very money focus. But I would just say that, you know, productivity growth is not all about about without money. It is also about the you know, software areas of how how countries develop as well. So I I, I just chip that one in as a as a sort of slightly left field way of thinking about productivity. 
Well, what's your question? So I think our, what we could do is forecast as an analyst is a more negative thing, unfortunately. It's, we can identify what are the reasons why it's not going as well elsewhere. By being able to say how it compares to what's going on in other places, that might paint a message as well, if only could, we could do what they were doing, that would be a way forward. Whether that is feasible and viable as a policy for Scotland, I think is a somewhat different issue. But we don't see it primarily as our role to work out what policies the Scottish Government should do to drive up tax yep. revenue. I absolutely understand that. It's just to set effective policies, it is helpful to know where uh, not only where the, the negative uh, concerns are, but the potential for growth. And yeah. as I say, I come back to your reports over uh, several years now where you are highlighting the, the tax revenue uh, situation as being absolutely critical. Could I just ask one further question about um, the, the, the current inflation situation? Because you've highlighted this morning, as well as within your report, that there are different factors. There's the cost push angle, where quite clearly um, global prices, uh, particularly in the energy market and supply chains, are causing very significant um, cost push. And there is the demand pool side, where by obviously hoping that demand within the economy um, and increasing uh, earnings eventually will drive that up. Are there different timescales, do you think, where that inflation effect will start to diminish? Is it different for the cost push in comparison with the demand pool? What, what do you think the likely scenario is when we do start to see inflation tailing off? Will that largely be because of the cost push situation or the demand pool? Well, I think it was a cost push element that we were thinking about as being the reason why we thought inflation would come down quite rapidly over the next few years. It was just we didn't see what the sources of cost push were that would sustain that mm. rate of growth of price increase. There's still quite high demand out there because um, people coming out of the pandemic have accumulated lots of savings. Not everybody, but uh, certain parts of the population have. That's still there to be spent in some ways. They haven't blown all of that. So there is still potentially quite high levels of demand out there to be met. So I think it's more the cost push side where if you wanted to see inflation falling away, that would be the element where you, you'd look. Francis, would you? No, I think that's right. I think that, you know, in a sense, if you wanted to go back to the discussion we had before as to what the, the fears are about this prolonged inflation is from the demand side. Yeah. That's where, it's, where, where this, this is going to prolong the cost push. We no, Clearly, it's still anything could happen, but the, but the feeling is, as we've discussed, it's a, it's a one-off, and that, that that is the most likely scenario from the cost push side. So it's really whether that then gets translated into, a, you know, the, we, in combination with the tight labour market, you know, gets it gets related into a longer-term inflation problem. I think that's where that risk comes from. Thank you. That's very helpful. Thank you very much. I think uh, Iceland has always been very social cohesive, but it was always historically one of the poorest countries in Europe. But I think. Independence in 1944, harnessing geothermal power and victory in the Cod War in the 70s has probably also had a very significant and positive effect. Ross? <laughs> Thanks, Commissioner. How did I follow that? Um, I, I've only, so much has been covered already, so I've only got two questions this morning. The first is just going back to uh, Daniel's theme around productivity and specifically the um, assumptions that you've made around this inflection point this year that's it's in figure 3.13 and, and, and that growth in productivity. David, you mentioned that that's essentially um, the, the assumption there is based on uh, getting more people, in, not more people into jobs because unemployment is low, but getting more people into the, the right jobs. But if we look back in the, the kind of highest profile examples of labour shortages over the last year or so, they've not been in particularly high wage sectors. Your retail and hospitality has been one of the, the biggest examples. So could you maybe expand a little bit on the assumptions you're making around this rearrangement within the labour market? Because uh, what I took from what you were saying before is there will be sectoral winners and losers from this, because it's not about reducing unemployment, it's already quite low. Some sectors are going to end up probably with labour shortages as a result of workers moving into the sectors that will result in the kind of productivity growth that you're assuming. C could you expand a little bit on the underlying assumptions there? OK, well, in, in the longer term, the labour market should work in the way that you get adjustments in wages, you get adjustments in people's expectations about where they're likely to get good employment. And those 
end up shifting labour around between sectors. So you get the right amount in the right sectors. So in the longer run, we expect markets to work and broadly sort out that problem. It's quite hard to say exactly how that's going to break down sector by sector, because it will depend on what responses there are in wages in different sectors, um, what type of sector it is, what type of wage negotiation goes on in that sector. So there, there are a lot of detailed factors that make it quite hard to predict in detail how that's going to go. But broadly speaking, economists take the view that these things do get sorted out. There will be some levels of wages across different sectors that will get the right people into the right jobs. Um, having said all of that, we still think that the COVID pandemic will have long-run scarring effects on the young people. That is still the widespread prediction uh, of the effect of the pandemic. Because if people who had gone uh, out of school thinking they might go into, the, say, the hospital hospitality sector, develop some skills there, move on and start at some point running their own pub or their, their own restaurant. All of, those ex all of those early stages in their career were taken away by the hospitality sector being closed. They're now facing new job, new school leavers competing for the same jobs uh, as the hospitality sector opens up again. So their, their job market profile is very different from what it was had the pandemic not taken place. And that could have long-term effects on what their long-term salary levels will be, what their long-term levels of promotion will be. So we certainly expect the pandemic to have long-term effects on workers, albeit there will be workers in various sectors, various jobs. They may not be the same jobs and the same salaries they would have expected to get had the pandemic not taken place. Thanks very much. Taking on board what, what you've just said around it being really difficult to predict the impact, the, predict in detail the impact on various sectors. If, if I could try and press you for, for one element of that, not on a specific sector, but are these assumptions based more on a, an assumed growth in existing high wage sectors or in the average wage in what are currently low wage sectors like in retail and hospitality? rising. What, what's the, the balance of the two? Are you assuming that these low-wage sectors, that there will be an improvement in pay in the, those areas, or just that people will continue moving out of them into existing high-wage areas? To be, to be honest, we just haven't broken the analysis down at that level to say where some of this matching is worse, where it will go in the future, and where wages will go. A lot of our forecasting is still at a pretty aggregate mm. level, so I don't think we can break it down at Quite a level. I don't know, Francis, if you want to. No, just, I, I think exactly right. Where we haven't gone down to the, you know, who's, who's got to move where. But I think your, your point is right that there is a degree of labour market mismatch at the moment. You know, basically people in the, in the wrong jobs, who, and then you know, jobs vacancies waiting in some sectors, people still employed in sectors that possibly should need, need to shrink or, or do things differently. Um, we, we, we're not, you know, we haven't done the detail of what those flows are, but we do know in the background that makes. Another, it's another reason why analysing the economy right now is quite hard, because we don't know what the economy looks like when everybody's you know, shifted place and everything is back to normal. We're, we're still in the transition where the mismatch is still being worked out, and so the economy feels tight, but, but that may be just because that, that mismatch is still being resolved. Right. And uh, sticking with uh, that spirit of uh, high-level assumptions, just one final high-level question. It's probably just asking you to... to pull together various points that have already been made, but you've seen in the, the IFS precursor to the, the spending review, they essentially said that the Cabinet Secretary had the option of uh, axing, taxing or hoping, i.e. kicking the can down the road and hoping that more money would appear somehow later. And you know, that boils down to either difficult decisions could be made now or we could just hope things will get easier in the future. On balance, do you think this spending review was a successful exercise if the measure was making difficult decisions now, or is there still a high level of can-kicking going on here? Can I just make a point about the IFS um, uh, view and, and um, 
report and, and article, which is that they published that, I think, the Friday before the Tuesday when the uh, spending review and our forecast were placed in front of Parliament. So they didn't, because of timing, didn't have the advantage of um, either our up-to-date numbers or, in particular, the government's um, uh, view on how we'd have balanced budgets going forward based on those up-to-date numbers. So I think you just need to put it in that um, in that context. Um, it, but the you know in principle the, the the right sort of challenges were being raised. What happens here? Um, you asked whether and you know this was a sensible thing to to do the resource spending review. And I think I referred to that previously. I think my colleagues would agree that overall um, it. it some might say it was a brave thing to do, but it, it seems to me that it was right to do it because um, it gives um, it gives currency is the wrong word. It, it gives the, the the concepts that the government can then use as the actual numbers come in and they see what funding really is over the next year and the year and the year after and what the actual costs are. It's spending really is, and they will have to make adjustments. Um, but they, they they have a better. It, it's it's more. Um, anchored, more rooted because of the um, spending reviews. So I think it was a good thing to do, but colleagues, do you share that view? Yeah, I think in, in, in the very nature, the, the, balance, the budget, budgets had to, you know, this, uh, this document had to be published with balanced budgets projected into the future meant that that question you asked at the beginning had to be answered. There was no way to dodge it because it, 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 there wasn't, a, you know, a, an alternative, there wasn't anywhere else to put the uh, the mismatch, the, the uh, you know the, the funding gaps, or whatever that you call them. So I think in that sense, it, it has given a, a fair amount of clarity as to how this situation will will develop. So. The other thing to say is that within the figures we published to support the spending review, there are elements of both taxes and cuts in spending there. So because of our assumption, the baseline assumption that the higher rate thresholds will be frozen. That will generate more tax revenue. That's reflected in the, in the assumptions in the forecast and the spending review. But also, as Susan said in her opening remarks, you have seen significant cuts in real spending in the non-health, non-social security area. So there has been a combination of both tax and acts in there. Thanks very much. I can see the Cabinet Secretary at the door, so I will wind up my questions there, Convener. Thank you very much for that. I appreciate that. Uh, we have actually a lot of more questions I'm sure we could ask, but time is against us, and as Ross has pointed out, the Cabinet Secretary is uh, uh, waiting to come in, and we have another section about to start. So I want to, um, just as I wind up this session, again formally thank uh, Dame Susan Rice for all her phenomenal work over the years, her leadership and her wisdom and indeed insight, uh, which has proven uh, invaluable to this committee. Like John, I was here at the very birth of the SFC, and it's great to see how it's developed and flourished over the years, and I'm sure it will continue to do so. And of course, I will see you tomorrow, Dame Susan, at the Spice Briefing, which uh, starts at 8 a.m. with bacon rolls, just for those who have not already sold on the idea of attending. So thank you very much. <laughs> and we'll call a break until 11.25. Thank you. <laughs>
We will now continue our evidence taking on Scotland's economic and fiscal forecasts to May 22 and the Scottish Government's resource spend review and medium term financial strategy. I welcome to the meeting the Cabinet Secretary for Finance and the Economy, Kate Forbes, MSP. Ms Forbes is accompanied by Scottish Government officials. Andrew Watson, Director for Budget and Public Spending, Gary Gillespie, Chief Economist, and Andrew Scott, Director of Tax and Revenues at the Scottish Government. I welcome you all to the meeting and invite Ms Forbes to make a short opening statement. Morning, thanks Kate. very much, uh, Convener, and thanks to the, the Committee for <coughs> its input to the Resource Spending Review and the Medium Term Financial <coughs> Strategy. It's obviously a, a hugely challenging time to be delivering a spending review. We're recovering from a pandemic as well as experiencing the unprecedented cost of living crisis, and there's quite clearly significant volatility in the funding outlook. Despite that, though, I think our partners uh, appreciate as much uh, certainty and transparency as possible when it comes to uh, setting out the spending parameters over uh, the next few years. And that's what um, lies behind the, the spending review, which commits £180 billion um, over uh, the next uh, few years. Now, we started off this process by focusing on a number of key objectives, a number of key priorities. Obviously, by extension, where you have priorities, uh, then you focus um, your attention and the funding on those priorities, and that includes tackling child poverty, transitioning to net zero, economic recovery, as well as strengthening the public sector in Scotland. Obviously, in addition to that, we added uh, responding to the cost of living crisis. Um, we've also set out commitments to drive uh, reform and greater efficiency across the public sector. That's because notwithstanding the current uncertainties, uh, the funding position is constrained. In terms of that funding position, obviously the assumptions in the MTFS and the spending review are based principally on the existing block grant settlements. That was implied by the 2021 UK spending review, the OBR forecasts of future public spending and then updated tax and social security forecasts from uh, the Scottish Fiscal Commission. And when the UK spending review, of course, was set last autumn, it, inflation was about 3.1 per cent. Despite inflation now hitting about 9 per cent, a 40-year high, the UK government hasn't updated its spending it plans. So we have far less funding in real terms and have had to use um, the, the best assumptions that we have uh, available. In addition to that, we've obviously seen a real terms reduction of 5.2 per cent between last year and this year, and our real terms funding grows by only about 2% across the whole four-year period once you account for the devolution of social security uh, benefits. So as the committee knows, I've highlighted some of these challenges um, when it comes to the, trying to deliver our priorities and uh, there, are other, there are issues that emerge as a result of that. I think too it goes to the heart of a point that the committee has flagged in the past, which is the limitations of the current fiscal framework and the lack of economic and fiscal levers available to the Scottish Government to manage that volatility and that risk which are inherent in any uh, forward-looking spending uh, review. My last point, convener, is that we've also undertaken a targeted capital uh, review to address a lower than expected capital grant allocation provided by the UK government, because you'll recall that we had set out our capital spending review in advance of the UK government's uh, spending review to try and provide as much certainty to partners as we emerge from the pandemic. But that capital spending review will invest around £18 billion pounds between April 2023 on the 31st of March 2026, with over half a billion of additional funding directed at net zero programmes compared to previously published plans. So, as I conclude briefly, the aim of these plans is to provide as much long-term certainty as possible in an extremely volatile economic situation. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much for that opening uh, statement. I think what's significant is the fact that you have very little room to manoeuvre, and I think that's appreciated by the committee. But clearly, we'll be asking questions about the choices that the Scottish Government has uh, made uh, and, and why those choices obviously have been made. First thing I would ask, though, is, I mean, that in terms of the detail, I think there has been an element of frustration, I think, from some of the outside organisations that, you know, and I, and I would say, because I know that you would want to, to make that clear up front, is that this is not a budget. You know that this is a, a, a resource spending review, but the, one of the concerns has been that we've only so far received uh, level one and level two funding uh, in, in that, and a lot of organisations are obviously wondering where they would fit in with some of the decision making that's taken place 
Yeah, it's, I think it's a fair question, and it was captured in some of the, the pre-RSR publication uh, analysis by the Fraser Valander. I think Fraser Valander had asked the question around the granularity that could be published, and had indeed suggested that we might just publish a, a high-level narrative with priorities. I thought it was important that we provided as much granularity as possible, which is why it goes to level two. The risk that we face is that due to the level of volatility in the funding, and I can unpack a lot of the assumptions underneath the funding available, it, due to that level of volatility, it's extremely difficult to be any more granular than, than level two. And even providing level two detail was was, was challenging. Um, part of that is driven by inflation. I've already said that much of our spending review is based on the, the UK government spending review, which you would accept, you would expect. And uh, inflation was 3.1%. We're at 9%. It's going to rise. And I think we have to make a judgment on, uh, on, on that risk. And actually, being too granular carries with it its own risk in terms of planning and forward planning, which may then not come to pass. So it is, it is, it's not easy, and it's not a budget. At the end of the day, this is not a budget, and we will set out, for example, our tax rates and our public sector pay policy in advance of each budget. So you're right in commenting on it being a, a judgment call, and I think we have pushed as hard as possible to be as granular as possible in an extremely volatile situation. Yes, I think, I mean, from my reading of the situation, it appears that you've been very cautious in terms of your spending proposals. I would imagine that you would be hoping to be able to add some resources to the figures that are actually outlined here. But if we actually look at the, to start off with, the level one figures, um, when, when you made your statement in Parliament last Tuesday, you said, and I quote, we've prioritised spending on health and social security, education and tacking tackling climate change. But if we look at educational skills resource, um, you know, the first four years of the of the spending envelope from this year onwards, there appears to be virtually no increase, a 1% increase in cash terms over the next, uh, uh, this four-year period, the next three years. And then, um, interestingly, in 26-27, there's a huge jump of about 17%. Um, there's actually a number of other areas where we see also significant changes almost in that last year. So I'm just wondering why uh, that is the case and why, you've, why the, the decision is that if uh, education is to be prioritised, why the funding has been kept very tight over the next few years and then suddenly there's a significant jump in that 26-27 year. Well, much of this comes back to the, the core objectives that I set out. So, for example, tackling child poverty. And... Much of the spend for tackling child poverty is, of course, in the social security line, which you'll see, but um, much of it is also in the education line. So rolling out um, uh, free school meals, for example, as well as uh, early learning and childcare expansion. And so when it comes to the, the, the trajectory of spend, we have tried to ensure that the trajectory of spend in each portfolio matches the plans for rollout or expansion um, of particular uh, uh, initiatives. I'll see if uh, anybody else wants to, to come in in terms of the, the breakdown by year. But that's been our starting position, where we have tried to match the, the funding to the, the commitments that have been made that are specifically tied in with core objectives. There is another element to this, though, as well, which is that the, the trajectory is quite bumpy over the next few years because of either the impact of uh, reconciliations that need to be accommodated. So, for example, uh, larger reconciliations in certain years than in other years. Now, you, because that eats into spending uh, power, uh, because there's a limit of only using £300 million of borrowing to manage some of those reconciliations, you then have to use your core spending power to make up the difference, as it were. So we've also tried to smooth the trajectory so that you don't have a portfolio, for example, that's dealing with a, a, a rapid and sudden drop in one year, only then to, to climb up in the following year. Mm -hmm. Because that's, that's employees, that's workers. You, you can't expect a, a, a portfolio take education to see a, a, see a drop. So we've tried to smooth the trajectory over that period um, across portfolios. I don't know if there's anything else to add from anyone else, but I... I I hope that answers sort of the, the macro question as well as the, 
particular question. It's, it's, it's just almost like in real terms, you're going to have decline in education over the next three financial years. Then suddenly you've got a, 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 quite a dramatic increase. And I mean, that's repeated in a number of portfolio areas. I mean, time is against me to ask all the questions on that. So I'm going to try and touch a number of areas uh, so that colleagues can follow up some of them. Uh, if they so wish. Um, another area, obviously, is local government. I mean, obviously, local government is alarmed that, although you said it's a, a fair settlement that, that local government will have over the years ahead, I don't believe that they will agree with that. And I'm just wondering how the kind of static or declining budget when inflation is taken into account, how that really um, allows uh, flexibility for local government, because clearly much of what local government spends its funding on is statutory services. So they have to provide them. They don't have a choice. Uh, and obviously, if statutory services are, are already have a high, high proportion of spend than perhaps they did five or ten years ago because uh, of, of the relative reduction in local government um, uh, resource on that. So that's one thing on local government. Also on local government, if there's greater flexibility, as has been talked about, and I know you're looking for public workers, sector workers, for example, to be more productive, but perhaps for a four-day flexible working week, how does that impact on other areas of the economy, like, for example, um, transport, uh, uh, where there's a significant reduction in the number of people who are using public transport, not only because of a, of a lack of reliability. You know, for example, my area is a lack of bus drivers. We've also we've seen real disputes. This is, there's issues across the UK in that regard. Um, and um, the retail sector, how would that be impacted? You know, as a knock-on from the fact that a lot, you know, lots of public workers might be staying at home. And another area you've, you've talked about in this uh, is the multi-year estates programme. And I think, obviously, from reading the document, there seems to be a kind of a, a kind of enthusiasm for selling off surplus public buildings. If, for example, there are going to be fewer people in the public sector and more people may be working hybrid or from home. But the, the difficulty, for, for, as I see that, for local government will be that in some areas of Scotland there might not be much demand for their surplus public buildings, whereas in other areas, for Edinburgh, for example, there might be a significant demand, and that would mean that some local authorities would be unbalanced in terms of the resource availability. So I know that's a fairly convoluted question, but it's about how local government is going to be able to innovate and reform and at the same time cope with these yeah. Uh, huge changes over a relatively short period of time. So I think I've read, uh, heard three questions in that, so I'll take those uh, It's because I'm trying not to, I'm trying to allow other people a chance yeah. to come in. So, so, absolutely. Ask too much. So, so, so firstly on local government, and I think this is going to be a recurring theme of the various questions that are asked this morning. It's a very similar question to what you just asked me around education. And I am not uh, in any way denying the extremely challenging outlook that we face right now within the, the, the funding available to us, and the job we've had in trying to be as fair as possible right across the public sector. Now, one brief tangent. If you recall in our budget, we set out three objectives, which tap on child poverty, transitioning to net zero, and improve uh, in, an economic recovery. Now, we've intentionally added resilient public services to that. Because if you were to just base all your decisions on those first three, then your core public services um, are going to, to, to find it very challenging. So we have tried to protect um, those core public services. But that is not in any way to say that it isn't an extremely difficult outlook. You know, th there's no two ways about it. And that's where the other two parts of your question around um, public sector reform, including, for example, the estates, is so important. Because if we can become as efficient as possible, then it allows us to focus our, our, our funding on frontline services and ultimately focus on, on achieving those objectives. So two quick points on, on local government. Um, under certainly the most challenging of circumstances, we have protected the, the revenue budget in cash terms, so it sees £100 million in the final year, and we've also protected the baseline of £120 million um, from uh, this year. Um, and so that means that local government will receive about £42.6 billion over the resource spending review period. But the second point here is that because it is level two, what those figures don't include is uh, the funding that is normally allocated to, to, to local government mm -hmm. um, from other parts of uh, portfolios. So, for example, the, the transfers from education, the transfers from social care. So there will be a, a significant uplift that you'll see in future budgets because the Resource Spending Review does not provide the granular detail on the, the, the funding that is, that is made available um, through those transfers. 
There is a point there on flexibility, and it has to go hand in hand with the fiscal framework. And now that um, we've, we're through the local government elections, that work is being dusted off again. Um, it hasn't stopped, but obviously it had to be suspended briefly during the, the local government elections. And that fiscal framework has got to look at maximising the flexibility and maximising empowerment of local authorities. Um, on your other points, perhaps I'll just more briefly say that uh, on, on the estates, um, this, is, this is not about... Uh, this is not about focusing all of Scottish Government workforce, for example, in, in Edinburgh. This is about the fact that across Scotland we have hybrid working now and therefore for me to continue to renew leases, and it is largely leases rather than necessarily outright ownership, to continue to renew leases when buildings are only half or a quarter occupied doesn't make financial sense. So it's about how to ensure we maximise the use of that estate. And if we can save money on, for example, estates, then I can maximise more money for Social Security to feed hungry kids or to help with uh, frontline workers. Yeah, I, I mean, I completely agree with that. But it's not about, obviously, as you said, focusing, uh, you know, uh, public sector workers in the end, but it's about the distribution of capital receipts. So my concern, obviously, there is that if, you know, you're unable to sell buildings in some parts of the country, you know, whereas in other areas you might have a high demand and indeed a higher price per square foot received for that. How would the Scottish Government balance, would the Scottish Government look to balance that? Because it's quite rigid, the funding formulas we have at the moment, and I just feel that some of the poorer local authorities might be left behind because they don't, will, won't be able to generate those capital receipts unless the Scottish Government looks at a way of perhaps redistributing. And of course, when you do that, then you get the other problem in that some councils say, well, there's no incentive for us to sell a building if the money's going to go to another council. So there's going to have to be a way in which these, the, this circle is, is, is actually uh, squared. So uh, that, that's the thing. I just want to leave hanging there. But again, I need to move on because there's a lot to cover. Now, the, the, the government obviously has very significant uh, climate change ambitions, but I think, it, and, and we've requested further detailed information uh, um, cabinet, from the Cabinet Secretary uh, in recent weeks, but I still think there's a frustration that we haven't got all the information we require. I mean, one of the issues that we have is that even if the money is made available, uh, for example, um, and this is a question I've asked to the First Minister, actually, um, it, it directly as well, is um, decarbonisation over a million homes and 50,000 non-domestic buildings by 2030, on page 22 of the report, uh, supporting our commitment to cut car kilometres by 20% by 2030, and uh, loads of other um, commitments there. Where is the workforce going to come from this? Because if we actually look at the level two detail in terms of uh, training and skills, there seems to be a significant um, reduction in terms of that area. Uh, well, sorry, employability and training is actually going to be stagnating for a year or two, and then you've got an 80 per cent increase up to 2027. But enterprise, tourism and trade, which one would have thought would be tie in hand with that, actually will have a 9 per cent reduction over the four years. Uh, and that's before you even look at inflation. So it seems to me you're trying to encourage enterprise and innovation, but the budget's been slashed significantly, and training isn't really kicking in at this stage, despite these huge ambitions f with, a, with a skills and labour shortage. So on that in particular, um, obviously employability is going up. So it, it's a choice. Employability, and I'm sure we're going to come back to this, Employability and skills are the two areas that people probably most frequently raise with me in terms of the, the pressures right now, particularly with unemployment at 3.2%, and the need to invest. And therefore, within that finance and economy portfolio, you see an intentional choice of investing more in employability and skills, and the skills line does go up. Um, and as a result, we therefore cannot you know, mirror that significant increase across the board. Because you, you, you just, by nature, in a budget, cannot prioritise everything. Um, when it comes to enterprise and skills, that links back to the National Strategy for Economic Transformation and the constant refrain from the Economy Committee and others about declutter, decluttering landscape. So we need to be as efficient as possible. That does not compromise our objectives. But we need to ensure that we're reducing duplication across um, various uh, public bodies that operate in the enterprise and skills space. So to my mind, the, the, the balance that we've sought to stru strike in the finance and economy portfolio is the right one. It reflects the constant refrain I'm hearing right now about the need to invest in skills.
um, as well as to ensure that we are as efficient as possible in supporting uh, businesses. Um, so when you say where is workforce going to come from and the need to invest in training and skills, that is why I have prioritised it like that. Now, that means that the focus will nearly always be on the areas which are not seeing the, the, the more generous uplift. But the focus is very seldom on the areas that are seeing um, an uplift in, in, in challenging areas. On climate change specifically, I think it's important to, to say at the outset that from a capital perspective, certainly, we cannot reach net zero without leveraging in private funding. I don't think there's any question about that, and I don't think there's any dispute on, on that. You know, it's where the Scottish National Investment Bank has a role to play in terms of leveraging in private uh, investment. So we're going to need private investment. We can allocate uh, public funding out of our um, uh, capital available, uh, bearing in mind that that's approximately about £5 billion a, a year, £450 million approximately uh, per annum in terms of borrowing capacity and capital. But it's going to take more than public funding for us to reach net zero. Um, and I don't think we should... Um, we should hide that. So hopefully that answers both the skills question as well as the, the funding question. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Um, I, I would say, though, that uh, in terms of private funding, are you talk you're not talking necessarily about businesses. You're talking about, for example, homeowners having to invest significantly in transforming their own houses. To I, I'm actually talking a lot about private investment mm -hmm. in terms of you know, we'll come through COP26 where, um, you know, GFANS tells us that there's $130 trillion of uh, assets under management right now that are looking for a home in uh, significant infrastructure projects and other things to help with that, that transition. So I'm talking about the substantial sums of private sector funding that is available. Right, but you can only actually deliver, A, if you've got the money, but B, if you've got the personnel. But the other thing... Uh, which I had a meeting yesterday with uh, um, Stackis Forestry, LLP, um, as they, they funded a bridge I was opening yesterday in my constituency. And they said one of the real drawbacks, one of the things that tears their hair out, is the sclerotic way in which, um, it, it, uh, um, in which the, the public sector deals with, for example, uh, developments, planning applications, etc., etc. Uh, for, I'll just give you one, exa one example from my own constituency. Uh, you know, a, a road junction which was agreed way back in 2020. For 18 months, I've been chasing Transport Scotland for a start date on site, or even when it's going mm. out to tender. And all I get back is, uh, you know, um, government uh, processes uh, uh, and procedures are taking place. Yeah. You, know, you know, 18 months. I mean, I, they don't even tell me what they are even yeah. though I've asked them, I've raised it in the chamber, it's still no start date. And people, if people are going to invest in Scotland, they need to actually have a structure in place that not only welcomes that investment, but processes it. Years ago, I read a, 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 an article by the, the former chief executive of West Lothian Council, who went from coffee boy to up to uh, chief exec, uh, and... Um, he basically was asked how he turned it round, and obviously proximity to Edinburgh helped, but he said, well, we turned all planning applications round within a month. Mm -hmm. We either said yes or no, you know, indicatively, mm -hmm. and then we would go into further detail necessary. And so people knew West Lothian was a place in which you could invest. Now, clearly there's an issue about shortage of planners, and, uh, you know, so that has to be addressed. But surely in this day and age, we must be able yeah. to have a position whereby we can approve... Um, projects much more expeditiously, or quite frankly, go again at another project involving 900 jobs, you know, uh, in terms of the um, uh, of the zero carbon um, 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 uh, area. And uh, basically, they say they, they actually were going to consider moving to uh, Teesside because a planning the planning committee put back their the, de the deliberations for 11 weeks now. And I contacted the chief executive of the council; they brought it back forward so that that won't happen. But, you know, th this happens all the time. And in terms of reform, what are we going to... I know it's a long-winded yeah. question, but it's because I feel quite passionate about it, and as do many. Um, what are we going to do about, yeah. about that? Yeah. I, I feel equally passionately about it, and I appreciate that on this resource spending review, there's, there's much that is challenging. There's much that's difficult. But I don't think it's unreasonable to set out a programme of improving our outcomes. And that goes hand in hand with efficiency. So for example, I don't know in your examples that you've identified what the cost was of that inefficiency. You know, how many um, 
people, had to, how many teams had to uh, manage that application, um, how many, how, you know, what the cost is of that additional time and that additional inefficiency. And that's the kind of thing where if we are serious about achieving our objectives, we have to make sure that the processes are there, the processes are efficient, and we have the right people and the right teams uh, to deliver that. And that's where I think the resource spending review um, does two things. One, it sets out the challenges of the, 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 the financial position. And you know, I, 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 can't, I can't change that because I can only spend what the SFC forecast. But equally, it sets out the fact that if we want to get better and if we want to improve our ability to meet our objectives, we're going to have to take a long, hard look at how we achieve that. And I've used the example in the enterprise and skills space um, where you know, if we have, if you take a business organisation, I'm sure we all have uh, businesses in our, 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 area, our constituencies who go to five, six, seven different public bodies because five, six, seven different public bodies provide grants. That's inef that is inefficient. We want it to make it easier for businesses to access the help that they need in a one-stop shop. Yeah, and it'd be told, it'd not just be told manana when, when they put an application and when it's going to be dealt with, actually, it would help if there was a detailed timescale. But on, on, um, on, on procurement, uh, Scotland and indeed the whole UK pay significantly higher in terms of procuring things such as you know road upgrades, for example, simple, straightforward things in continental Europe. Is that an issue that's going to be addressed? Are we going to look at the procurement costs here compared to elsewhere? Because I mean that would release if, if we had if procurement costs were reduced to continental levels, that would release significant funding to enable us to have more projects. How often have people walked or driven along the road and seen a seen a you know a, you know you're, you're stuck at the at the track? Um, some road works for half an hour and you get past it, there's no you remedy working there, you know. It doesn't matter what time of day or night you actually um, go past, it never seems, never seems to be MD there. Or else there's one guy in a digger and ten folk looking at the hole he's dug. I remember raising this, you know, I mean, sure we've all experienced it. I raised this with Stuart Seams in 15 years ago and uh, he said that that would be looked at and I'm still waiting, if you know what I mean. So I think these are real issues that we have to address in terms of, I mean, you know, the... the um, you know, a crisis is a mother of advent adversity is a mother of invention. So surely this is a time to really address these these issues. Mm. And will procurement? What, what kind of what focus will it be on procurement? I've been in a situation where three, four years from now we're still asking the same questions. We're not seeing any real significant yeah. improvement, other than less money getting spent on the ground. So, and I think that's the necessity of the art of resource spending review. So again, uh, we cannot afford not to make these reforms, and a. Uh, the, the four sort of pillars of the reform agenda within the resource spending review includes procurement. So it's encouraging public bodies to look at four areas where we might drive efficiencies. One is on estates, you've already touched on that. One is on shared services. Um, one is on procurement, and then the other is on grant management. So, you know, what the RSR doesn't do is give all the answers uh, in one go as to how we're going to achieve that. But it does set out a plan over the next few years for, for driving that reform. And the reason why we need a, a resource spending review to do that is because it's very difficult to drive reform within one year, very difficult to do it within annual budgets. So you need to have that longer term perspective of a three, four year uh, spending review in order to say, right, changes you make in year one might be expensive, but you will see the benefits in year four. Okay, one final question from me, because colleagues are clearly keen to come in, and that's regarding um, social justice, housing and local government portfolio. Uh, I noticed that in, in that area, 96% um, of the increase in spend over the next four years will be on social security, but half of that's uh, further... Um, welfare benefits will be devolved, but half of it is a choice being made by the Scottish Government. Now, given the kind of paucity of resources and the fact that, for example, the police are going to be faced with a zero budget at a time of rising cybercrime, etc., etc., uh, and, and various other areas are, are going to have to deal with fixed budgets, is it, is it the best use of public money to look to spend an extra $1.2 in benefits? And what will be the result in terms of... Um, uh, the wider economy of that spend and indeed removing people from poverty, which is clearly what this spend is about. Yeah, and I would argue that it is an important <coughs> spend. I would argue that £1.8 billion 
uh, for the Scottish Child Payment <coughs> is uh, an important uh, choice that we have made. But you're right, it is a choice. And where <coughs> you choose to prioritise one area of spend, then by necessity you are deprioritising um, um, other areas. And we have chosen to make tackling child poverty a core objective. We have backed that up with increased spend on social security. We have uh, reformed uh, social security powers that we have control over. And I think tackling child poverty has got to be one of this government's uh, missions. Interestingly, it's pretty much supported, I think, unless I'm told otherwise in the next few minutes, supported by all parties in the parliament as well. So it is a choice. Ultimately though, if we achieve our objective, those figures should decrease. You know, you shouldn't set out to invest in social security over the extreme long term, because if you manage to tackle child poverty, if you meet your child poverty targets, you should see that spending figure come down because there are fewer families who are in need of um, that additional support. I asked that very question of the Scottish Fiscal Commission, not today, but the last time they were here and they said that their view was it would have no impact on spending in actual fact. Um, uh, one, I would say, though, that the child um, poverty line, um, as distinct from Social Security assistance, is, is project, projected to increase from 34 to 97 million. So there's a significant increase in that, but that's only a fraction of the of the yeah. 2.4 billion increase in Social Security spend. Yeah, I mean, I mean it, is a, it, is, it has been a choice that we have made. The other difficulty with Social Security, of course, is that it's demand-led. So um, the, the forecasts will inevitably change because no forecast is 100% um, aligned with outturn. Uh, so we have got to make sure within our own budget that we have the capacity to meet that demand, irrespective of, of where the demand falls. So it does create um, risk and volatility, but it is a choice of this government. I think it's the right choice. And you know, in terms of Scottish child payment, I, I don't think it's unreasonable to suggest that if you meet your child poverty targets and the Scottish Child Payment is one of the levers for doing that, then you see that figure fall. But at a time of chronic labour shortage and skills shortage, surely trying to get more people into work is the ultimate cure for poverty, people having a good wage, etc. And there's an issue about people who are on the cusp of these benefits, i.e. the people who are working and just over the benefits who don't receive so many benefits. There's a real issue about the, 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 the relative burden they face in t terms of taxation, because what we're looking at in this £1.2 billion is an extra £500 a year for every taxpayer in Scotland, if you even it out. I mean, cl clearly, obviously, people on higher tax will be a, a relative share of that, but th that's an issue that people face. Some folk will, 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 who are on fairly low pay and haven't to work long hours will wonder whether or not that's the right priority. Um, and forward. obviously a, a lot of um, families that will receive the, the child payment or will receive additional support are already in work too. So you know, that is where you cannot look at, let's say, the £1.8 billion for the Scottish child payment in isolation from the employability and training line, which is going up by £100 million over uh, the next few years, because they are two sides of the same coin. You know, I, I think that from um, a, a child poverty perspective, it, governments have an obligation, a moral obligation, to care for children in poverty. That is not their choice. They are in poverty, and those figures it, need to be grappled with. But simultaneously, it's about helping parents not just to get into work, because many of them are already in work, but ensuring that they are paid uh, sufficiently, which is where the real living wage comes in, and to make sure it's secure employment. So, you know, the, Scottish, the, the Child Poverty Plan obviously captures all of this. The Resource Spending Review comes in behind and funds it. But I think we cannot ignore this issue and we've got to tackle it. Um, and we've made a choice to tackle it in terms of the priorities that we've set out for the Resource Spending Review. OK, thank you very much for that. Um, first person to ask questions will be John, to be followed by Liz. Uh, thank you very much, uh, convener. Um, we spent quite a lot of time looking at inflation in, with the Scottish Fiscal Commission uh, earlier on this morning and uh, looking at it from kind of different angles. And specifically, I mean, Professor Breeden talked about the previous kind of old-fashioned spiral we had in the 70s and 80s with wages and costs kind of chasing each other up. And, and they seem to think that is not going to happen this time. 
So they're looking at, they're predicting a real earnings decrease of 2.7%. Can I ask for your angle on that? I mean, do you see a, do you think there has to be a reduction in real earnings and, you know, wage increases cannot match inflation for the next period? Um, certainly from a, obviously we'll set out public sector pay policy in advance of every budget. But I've been clear in this year's budget that I cannot inflation-proof um, public sector pay policy because of the high level of uh, inflation and the fact that it is uh, due to, to rise. Um, I know, uh, conscious of, of the SFC's um, uh, forecasts and where they see uh, inflation going, averaging 8% across 2022-23, um, before falling back in line with the Bank of England's 2% forecast from 2024 to 2025. Um, that is very much in stark contrast with the inflation assumptions that were used by the UK government to underpin their spending review in October 2021. And so, you know, the difficulty of me answering that question beyond just this year and perhaps next year is to say that I have a, a funding um, pot available which is based on assumptions last autumn, which have been completely overridden, as it were, by the, by the, the inflationary outlook that's inherent in the SFC's forecast. I mean, I'm happy to bring in anyone else, if anybody else wants to come in on that, but I don't know if that was sufficient the I mean, I suspect there's no, no end to this. We could discuss yeah. this subject because, I mean, one of the other points this SFC made, and I suppose I was surprised they weren't a bit more certain, but as to how long inflation might last. Mm. So it may come back down again if, presumably, say, oil prices come back down. But if they don't come back down, it, it, it could carry on. Is that, is that you would agree yeah. with that? I don't know if Gary wants to comment. Yeah, no, I'll have to come in on that. So I think I, I'm nice to catch some of the conversation in the last sessions, I won't go over that, between cost push inflation and demand pool. And essentially, um, where we are at the minute is a combination of both. The supply side, cost pressures are really driving it. So in, in the context of where we think this is going to go, the Fiscal Commission, Bank of England, others believe the mechanical nature of the way inflation is calculated means it will come back down. So it's unlikely to have oil prices would need to keep rising at the same rate this time next year for that calculation to continue. The, so that's why you see the forecast coming back down. But I suppose your more general question is, what about the impact, I think referring back to the 70s, of uh, pay growth through labour pressure, wage pressure? And that question, I suppose, in a sense, is partly answered by the Fiscal Commission today as well, because in their assessment, they say real wages fallen by 2.7% on average this year. The Bank of England are forecasting average pay across the economy of around 5%. So you've got that squeeze. So if that's the squeeze for this year and inflation comes back down uh, to circa 3% as forecast, then wage pressure should uh, mitigate as well. Mm -hmm. The challenge, though, I suppose gets back to the convener and the earlier questions, is we have an incredibly tight labour market and the extent to which uh, bargaining, uh, businesses competing for staff, the extent to which we can ease that pressure. So I think, again, relates back to the, the Cabinet Secretary's previous comments about employability support as well, about getting more people into jobs, the change in nature of jobs as well. I think this then gets into a broader productivity discussion about how businesses use labour and the extent to which they replace labour through investment and capital. So, I think in the short answer to your question, it's perfectly feasible for inflation to be back down next year and for this to be a, a year to 18 month type shock. Um, the risks in the longer term are about Scotland's demographics and the extent to which we can address those. So even in a so so that could continue to give uh, pressure on the on the labour market. OK, well, others may have come in on that point, but I'll not, I'll not pursue it any further. Um, I was also asking the Fiscal Commission uh, about the emphasis on social security, and you've already been asked about that, and the, the fact that that will be protected and, and, in fact, more invested in that area. 
and will that have a knock-on effect? So I'd be interested to know if you think, because the, the, the concept has been that if we give people who are less well-off a bit more money, they will spend it locally, that will come quickly back into the economy and will boost jobs and eventually tax. Um, they said they haven't really made that kind of assumption. Uh, and I just wondered if you were expecting, as say, compared to if we gave more money to Scottish Enterprise, some of that might kind of leak out to the very higher paid people. Well, I think, I think from my perspective, and others may want to come in on this as well, that um, there's two Im impacts from um, getting Social Security right. One of them I've already touched on, so particularly with a view to Scottish Child Payment, where if you, if you manage to meet an objective like tackling child poverty, that will, in a very obvious way, deliver not just benefits for those families, but for, for the wider economy and for ultimately for public finances. Because um, if people are taken out of poverty and um, they're in well-paid, secure employment, you, know, you don't need me to spell out the, the benefits of that uh, to the, 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 the taxpayer in terms of pressure on public services um, and so on. But the other part to this is the, the tight uh, labour market. So again, if we are able to, to support people into work, if we're able to provide um, support for them. We know that when unemployment is 3.2 per cent, the area that we need to do most work on is on the economic inactivity uh, figures in order to um, expand uh, the, the labour market. So to my mind, you have a, there's a moral obligation to uh, ensure that those who are entitled to social security support get access to social security support in a dignified way. That is an ideological choice, which I think is the right one to make. But equally, if you get this right and you support more families out of poverty, then it inevitably delivers uh, benefits elsewhere, reduces other pressures on public services, and my hope would be um, does uh, boost certainly the, the, the labour market. Okay, thank you. And to move to another area, um, the suggestions have been that a headcount within the public sector would reduce to the same levels as pre-COVID, which I believe is 30,000 people less. Um, and I think within that, um, Daniel Johnson was giving us figures earlier, a, you know, there's been an increase of 14,000 in the NHS. So can we expect that there would be a reduction of 14,000 in the NHS, or how does that work out? So I think it's unlikely that you would see that in the NHS, and that's why I've intentionally set out quite a flexible approach where we know that there are some parts of the public sector that have grown and probably will need to grow to an extent further. So, for example, the National Care Service, if you, you know, that they will need to be able to flexibly uh, employ um, and uh, expand in some areas. There will be other parts of the public sector which no longer need to maintain the sort of COVID expansion of um, workforce. So rather than taking a, a UK government approach, which is to put arbitrary figures on, I think their figure was 91,000 um, FTE, um, which was to bring their staff numbers down to, to 2016 levels, um, we have set out that we will freeze pay bill, which does not equate to a freezing of pay levels, but we want to work with uh, uh, employers and trade unions over the next few months, certainly in advance of, of the budget, to understand how we can, we can manage those workforce um, numbers in a flexible way, which allows some parts of the public sector, like the health service, to continue um, to grow where it needs to grow and other areas to de decrease where they, they don't need that sort of post-Brexit, post-pandemic levels of staffing. Okay, thanks so much. Thanks, Kavir. Okay, thank you. Liz, to be followed by Michelle. Uh, thank you. Um, Cabinet Secretary, can I just begin with one uh, bit of clarification, if I may? Um, last week, uh, when we were in the Chamber, um, uh, both at the time of your statement and then later at First Minister's questions, um, we raised the issue about the information that was in the Scottish Fiscal Commission data, which is in uh, tables and graphs uh, 4.3 and 4.7, which made a projected estimate for 2026-27 of a £3.5 billion hole in the public finances. Now, you seem to be implying that that was not a correct estimate from the Scottish Fiscal Commission data, and could I just ask you why? 
No, um, that's, that's not uh, my position. These are forecasts from the SFC. Um, the 3.5 billion, I believe, was um, is actually our figure published as well in December, and it was based on a number of assumptions. The point I was making in my answer to you and the First Minister's answer was we are now working with a resource spending review that is completely balanced. So it is factually inaccurate to suggest that the resource spending review is not balanced because I must balance by law. That uh, the, 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 um, the, the sort of gap between spending and funding based on the RSR framework, which was published in December, um, has come to the fore again in recent days. That projection was based on, for example, inflation at 3.7% um, and 2% thereafter. It was based on social care growth in line with the 2018 medium term financial strategy. It was based on a whole number of assumptions and the resource spending review, in a sense, is the answer to um, a, a lot of these assumptions based on more accurate information. So I think what I'm very clear on is to suggest that there is a deficit in the resource spending review is inaccurate. These so, are based on forecasts in advance of the publication of the resource spending review. Right. So can I just be quite clear then that uh, did you use that $3.5 in your estimates uh, before the uh, financial... Uh, statement that you made, or were you using a different figure? That those uh, we, uh, we, we don't we don't use figures like that. We we come at it from the position of the SFC updating their forecasts in the weeks in advance of the resource spending review publication, and we then have to balance our, our spending commitments um, between December and the SFC finalising their forecasts a few weeks ago. There has been so much change to suggest that we go back to December figures is, is just inaccurate. Sorry, can I just press you on this, yeah. uh, Cabinet Secretary, because it's absolutely vital to the policies uh, and they, you know, I think it's very helpful, may I say, that we've got a, um, a statement that looks over a longer period of time, which is the first we've had since uh, 2011. I think that's extremely helpful. But obviously you, you are making your choices and setting your policy commitments um, based, I would hope, on um, you know, what you see as the accurate statistics. And what, what I want to know from you, um, given what you said last week, is what do you think uh, we need to take into consideration that changes uh, that uh, statistic that the Scottish Fiscal Commission uh, produced relatively recently? I mean, this, this question is hugely important because it goes right to the heart of why, how we how we build a budget or resource spending review. Mm. The notion that I would base a May publication on December figures, considering all that's changed since then, is, 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 is flawed. So if you look at the assumptions that underpinned our budget in December, the resource spending review framework in December, I can go through it. I can go through, it was SFC forecast for social security in December 2021. It was assumptions around pay growth. It was assumptions around health growth. It was assumptions around social care growth. It was assumptions around inflation. All of these forecasts have been updated, not by me, because it's not my job to forecast. It's the SFC's job to forecast. And the way that you build a budget or resource spending review is that you use the latest figures that the SFC provide me with, which they've now published, and I must balance my budget on the basis of that. So forecasts change constantly. Yes, I understand that, Cabinet Secretary. What I'm asking for, for, uh, you to tell us, because I think it is very important, just as you've uh, acknowledged yourself, is it, if these changes have all taken place, as you rightly point out, what is the figure that you are using for the black hole in the public finances? There is no black hole in public finances. Really? There is no black... I mean, this is, this is the most basics of a budget in this, that the Scottish Government sets. But it's not a budget, review. Cabinet Secretary. You said that originally. This is not a budget that you Indeed, or a resource spending review. I, I, I don't know how else to explain the absolute basics of Scottish Government budgets, which are or resource spending reviews, which are that I must balance. I can only spend to the penny what I am predicted or forecast to either raise or receive. You cannot have a position in a resource spending review or in a budget where I'm overspending. That's why querying the Scottish Fiscal Commission's assumptions is so important, because they start with assumptions, they provide us with forecasts, 
and I only can spend what they enable me to spend. Well, put it, let's put it round another way. On what have you um, made your projections for the policy choices that you have set out to the committee this morning? What, what statistics are you using? OK, the SFC forecasts, which are largely based on either the UK government spending review and on tax and social security forecasts. OK, right. Can I come to this uh, same point on a slightly different angle? You said uh, when you set out the um, National Economic Transformation Strategy that our universities, which, as you quoted, are integral to, <clears throat> to the realisation of the National Economic Transformation Strategy and play such a vital role when it comes to developing research and development and innovation. Why, Cabinet Secretary, are you cutting uh, their budget in real terms, given that they have very considerable influence on economic growth and ensuring that we are developing research and development? Three reasons why the outlook right now is challenging across the board. The first is that our budget has been cut by 5.2% from last year to this year and is forecast to grow by 2% in real terms once you exclude social security devolution. The challenge for every part of the public sector is captured in the fact that there is less money available. On top of that, we have inflation at 9%, forecast to go to 11%, reducing our spending power. On top of that, for every part or every line where you want to see an increase, there must be an equal and opposite decrease. And my job has been to try and treat all parts of the public sector as fairly as possible, including universities, knowing how important that they are. But that demonstrates, again, the point we were just discussing, which is that I cannot spend a penny more than what the SFC forecast I will either receive or raise. But, Cabinet Secretary, you, you, you have got to make choices about where, where you believe the Scottish economy can improve both in terms of the receipts that you will get in from tax revenues and uh, from other areas of expenditure, and where you uh, see that cutbacks have to be made. And you've spelt out some of the cutbacks uh, this morning. What information can you give to the university sector that proves that they are deserving of uh, probably an 8 percent real terms cut over the period of this financial strategy? Well, well bear in mind, in terms of that 8 per cent, what we, where we've tried to protect as much of the public sector as possible, including universities, is in cash terms. Now, you're quoting a real terms figure based on the fact that inflation is at a 40 year high and is eating into our spending power. So my commitment to universities, in the same way that I've committed already on the employability and training lines, is that we will protect them as far as possible. But by as far as possible, I mean the overall block grant I receive is not increasing significantly over the next few years, and inflation is currently at 9%. So by necessity, if you have got, if you're not seeing real terms growth in the funding you have available, then you can only go so far when it comes to allocating uh, funding. So universities, like many other lines, are hugely important. We will protect them as far as possible. If you want to see any part of the public sector increase when it comes to funding, either you need to take it from elsewhere or you need to increase the pot. So if any m extra money did become available to you that you're not currently expecting, would the universities benefit from that? I would hope so, yes. OK, we might hold you to that. My final point, can you just confirm, or perhaps one of your officials confirm, that the uh, COVID spend, which you mentioned uh, earlier uh, when answering Mr Mason, the COVID spend for 2020-21 was £8.6 uh, from the UK government and £7.1 billion for 2021-22. Would you be able to confirm that? Um, I don't know if we have those figures immediately to hand, because... Um, given evidence, obviously, on the, the future uh, budget, but we can probably write to you unless you've that got it. That would be very helpful Andrew. if we could. Fine. Thank you. OK, uh, thank you. Michelle, to be followed by Douglas. Uh, good morning. Uh, I, I mean, I, I'm sure for people watching this committee, I always say that and everyone laughs and says no one ever watches this committee, but the discussion about black hole or not black hole 
uh, I, I think is an important pivotal point because it's actually predicated on debt. Uh, and you make the important point about if there is a black hole or not is on actuals, not on forecasts. And I think perhaps the media have tended to use that in a very florid way. And there is actually... Uh, Dr. Vern Attrell discovered that there's a, pre I'm quoting here, precise point, a mathematical singularity which we can measure as a ratio of GDP divided by total debt at which an economy stops expanding and begins to contract instead. And that point, I'd simply note that the, the UK government is hugely in debt. That leads me on to the fiscal framework, though, and I wanted to just get some reflections from you. Um, so we know that any government, and also the UK government, will have frequent errors across a wide range of forecasts. The UK government, unlike the Scottish government, doesn't suffer any penalty as such, for example, having or it being forecast it will have to repay £817 million in 2024 to 25. And, of course, the UK government then doesn't have to repay that in a single year cycle. It can pay over several years. And, my point at the beginning, it can borrow. So perhaps this discussion really is about how the situation we've got at the moment, and I too applaud doing the, the resource spending review. I think it's, it's a very worthwhile exercise. But it does really sharpen the issues with the fiscal framework utterly, fundamentally, in what you're being expected to do within the limitations of what any other normal government can do. So I'd like some further reflections uh, from you, if you could, uh, around that issue before I move on. Yep. Yeah, so it's a, it's a very good point. Um, as we've just been discussing, forecasts are by their very nature mm -hmm. uncertain. So we're sitting, well, the SFC is doing it, I'm not doing it. They're sitting there trying to predict what our budget position will be in three years' time based on tax and on, um, a, on, on, on receipts from the UK government. Um, inevitably, I'm still to see a forecast that's 100% aligned with outturn because they are forecasts. Mm. <laughs> you know, they're based on assumptions. Um, we have seen the last three, four months how those assumptions can wildly fluctuate, you know, who predicted at war in Eastern Europe back in December. So inevitably, forecasts will change. What other governments can do around the world is accept that those forecasts should be managed nearly always through resource borrowing so that you smooth the trajectory and don't require the NHS or education to give up funding in order to manage forecast error. And that is what we're expected to do if the forecast error is greater than £300 million. And that's where it hits um, uh, next year and in subsequent years, where you see the impact of the pandemic, you see the impact of, through no fault of their own, uh, two different forecasters working on different assumptions and also forecasts that, that didn't come to, to fruition. Now, the, the reconciliation that's required in that year significantly exceeds the borrowing capability to meet that. So that means about £500 million having to be found from frontline services, whereas all it would take for the UK government is to adapt the fiscal framework in that one area to ensure that there's £500 million more for frontline services. Um, the other part to this is, goes back to my answer to the convener, which is around smoothing the trajectories. You can't expect the public sector to suddenly in one year absorb £500 million when it's, we're talking about a workforce and then see that climb again uh, in, 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 the, in, the, in the next year, which is why most governments uh, borrow for that. So the fiscal framework review is obviously ongoing. This for me is one of the most obvious areas where I would like to see progress. One of the arguments we've made in the past, for example, is using one of the the, 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 the borrowing powers for cash management, which we haven't used and we haven't needed to, to use, and redeploying that, for example, in, in terms of it managing forecast error. But I think it's one of the, the, the biggest areas, even if the, um, the, the resource borrowing for forecast error was indexed or was aligned to um, even inflation, uh, these, these things would make a big difference. Well, thank you for giving such a 
a clear illustrator. And I think you're making the point that uh, if you were going to start from, well, nobody would choose to start from here. It's an inefficient way to manage the, the finances. But it does lead me on to something else when I, when I read the document that I found uh, interesting. Because, again, what we're talking about here is people's understanding of what's actually going on. And I was very attracted in the economies of scale that you're looking at in terms of shared services, for example, which is, to me is an absolutely obvious benefit of where you could derive uh, value. And, I mean, obviously you've mentioned other areas, grant management and procurement and so on, and also in terms of the, public, the various public bodies, 129 of them or so on. But I suppose this also brings me to the point about the public understanding of this, and I can appreciate you have a useful conversation with councils about might we be able to do this, but I can foresee difficulties in terms of people won't want necessarily a shared service because they'll see that as a loss of control. So I agree with your approach about having a conversation, but I just wondered what further challenges you foresee about that. In principle, I think it's useful and it's good but given the discussion we've just had, I can see then it'll immediately throw up, oh, you want to get rid of this, you want to get rid of that, even though we're all aware of the huge fiscal constraints. So any more thoughts about how you're going to approach that and also the timescales? Because my experience is that even if you get agreement, it always takes longer than you think and it's always more expensive than you think and the return on investment is never quite what you think either. Yeah, so we, we'll certainly be engaging with um, obviously public bodies on on taking that reform forward. I think the important thing though is that the public sector obviously exists for the benefit of citizens and we need to start with citizens. Mm -hmm. Citizens are not necessarily going to be um, aware of or even interested in the, the back room shared services and particularly in an age of digitalisation and obviously digital is one of the, the key focuses as well. Things like shared cloud services, things like um, shared investment in, in digital capability. Um, we've already talked on things that are around uh, estates and, and sharing estate is going to lead to the need to, to share services as well. Um, and there's a lot of bodies that are doing very similar things around their finance or their HR capabilities. And again, I'm not sure that the citizen is as interested in the, the, the back room capabilities as they are in getting the service that they want. And I think all of us need to be aligned on the need to improve outcomes for citizens, whether that's an individual business, a household or, or anybody else. So we will certainly work with, with public bodies to look up the art of the possible. Um, but I want to ensure that we protect and preserve public bodies' autonomy to deliver the services to the citizens as they wish but work with them where they need, for example, investment in their IT or the digital, well, there might be scope to do that more effectively. Um, and certainly the Scottish Government's been working on, on our own shared services, um, even within the Scottish Government, you know, making sure that you have one system um, for, for, all, for all parts of, of the Scottish Government. So I think there's a lot of scope, but we will need to do it um, carefully. Um, and obviously we'll, we'll, we'll report the initial conclusions in the upcoming budget. OK, thank you very much. Good OK, thank you very much. Douglas, to be followed by Daniel. Thank you. Hi, Cabinet Secretary. Um, first question I had was around uh, local government um, finance. It yeah. probably comes as no surprise. Um, so it, it seems to be a, like a real-term cut of like 7% over the next um, four years. So is that not really passing the buck on to, to local government to really give huge increases to, to council tax going forward? Uh, no, it's not. Uh, but as I've said already, across the public sector, I think it's a very difficult outlook. And uh, from a local government perspective, uh, we obviously need to do this hand in hand with the work on the, on, on the fiscal framework um, and also recognising that this is not a budget. So I would well imagine that in future budgets, uh, they will see, for example, a significant uplift through the education and, and social security lines as a, a bare minimum. You also spoke about things like digitisation and reducing the state. Do you, do you not accept that many local authorities have already been doing that over the last four years? So for that to be given 
as a way that they can save money is actually quite insulting to those bodies because they've been doing that already. Yeah, and I'm not sure, unless you're quoting something I've said earlier, um, that I'm advising that or, or advocating that. What we are saying from a local government perspective is here's the spending parameters over the next few years and that allows you to plan, but it won't replace annual budgets. So it gives them, the, the, as, it say, as I said, the parameters, but it doesn't give all the details. And I think you know, future budgets will need to, to, to update on those details. Incidentally, I think there's a lot that we can learn from local government too, the way that local government works together, the way that COSLA facilitates a lot of that sharing of best practice. So I think you're right in saying that there's much for us to learn. Uh, but certainly, local government is, to all extents and purposes, fairly autonomous. We, spend the, send, we set the spending parameters, but ultimately it's for them to determine how they spend that money. Mm -hmm. But you're also given targets about public sector headcount, for example, you know, reducing by 30,000, we think, over the next few years. So uh, that's going to feed back to local government as well, isn't it? Well, they have choices to make on, within the spending parameters that they have. So I certainly don't dictate to local government as to how they use their funding. That's for local government to determine. Um, all I can do through the resource spending review is set out the spending parameters. It's for them to decide uh, what, what they do with that, that core budget. Obviously, there is additional funding on top of that for education and social security, which we do have more of uh, an influence over. Uh, but in terms of the, the, the core spending parameters, it's for local government to determine how they spend that. Mm, but if we think back to the reduction in headcount, you know, 30,000 has been mentioned, 15,000 um, of the additional 30,000 pre-COVID level was um, NHS. And I think you've already said that probably won't be affected much. So then the, the figures, the reduction is going to have to come from other places. And one of those places could well be local government. And... and all decisions around how local government spends its money is for local government to make. It's, I, I do not, as you will well know, I do not tell local government how to spend their core budget. It's, it's entirely up to them. But you've been suggesting a headcount reduction of 30,000. Across the public sector. So that is really And I've not put a figure that. on it. That figure is your figure or other people's figure. But what I've suggested is that we need to get back to pre-COVID levels. But if you take local government, one area, let's say, ELC expansion. That's seen a workforce expansion within local government. I'm not suggesting that that you know that, that is that is something that needs to, to, to continue. Um, but inevitably there will be other areas I'm assuming of the public sector, and it's for local government to answer this question, not for me to answer this question, where they might have seen a, a, an increase as a result of COVID that they may no longer need. But there might be other parts of local government in the same way that there are other parts of the public sector that need to see, um, see, see, see increases as we come out of the, the pandemic, which is why we're, we're being very flexible. But I think local government is quite unique in all of this discussion around public sector efficiency, because ultimately it's local government that makes the decisions, not me. I set the spending parameters. I don't dictate to local government how they spend that money. Mm -hmm. But I am, I'm struggling to see where this head count OK, we don't call it reduction. Efficiencies are going to, going to come from. If it's not going to come from NHS, it's, you've already said the ELC has expanded, so there's new nursery teachers there that we'll, you know, we can't get rid of them suddenly. So where, you know, where is the axe going to fall? I'm struggling to, to see it, Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, and we'll work with public sector employers. What I've been at pains not to do is to, A, set an arbitrary target on figures, although it's dominated the, the press, um, and secondly, dictate to specific public bodies what they need to do. We will engage with them and, most importantly, with trade unions over the next few months in advance of this upcoming budget uh, in terms of where the workforce uh, needs to reset. And it's, you know, it's based on a freezing of pay bill that doesn't equate to a freezing of, of pay levels. So that's, why, that's what's driving the need for reform. But I, I hope you'd accept that there's a fundamental difference in my relationship with, for example, a public body like Transport Scotland and my relationship with local government. Yeah, but I'm, I'm struggling to understand. Yes, you're, you're not dictating the, the, the figures in terms of headcount, but you are holding the purse strings in terms of the amount to spend on pay. So you are really dictating the headcount that's, that's, that's going to be in all sort of areas. Okay. Well, I've been, I've been quite open and honest about the need to, to freeze pay bill, but not pay levels. I don't think there's anyone that doesn't accept that over the last two very difficult years, 
there's been a lot of change in the public sector. And inevitably, some areas have had to see significant and rapid increases that are no longer required because of COVID. And indeed, because of Brexit. You know, initial teething challenges around, around Brexit saw spikes. And so it's about a, a general reset rather than setting arbitrary targets, which is what the UK government has done. But your questions really are stemming from local government perspective. And what I'm saying very loudly, very clearly here is that I don't tell local government what mm. to do, nor should I, in the way that I can more effectively work with other public sector employers. So, so in the figures that show a 7% reduction, real terms, is that, are you saying then that it's not going to be as bad as that for local, local government? I'm saying that this is not a budget and um, we have used, probably, you know, we've used what the SFC I think call reasonable assumptions to set our, our budget. But if you think about it, we're setting our budget on predominantly a UK government spending review of autumn last year, which is completely out of date, hasn't been updated to accept inflation. So do I think the numbers are going to fluctuate further? Yes, I do think the numbers are going to fluctuate so further. It might not be as bad as they expect then? Well, I would sincerely hope that our budget is not as, as bad as I fear. But ultimately, the only way for that to change is for the UK government to increase the, 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 the funding pot and to take into account the huge increases in inflation. Okay. Moving on to uh, something you said earlier about um, enterprise, that you weren't cutting the budget there, it was you were cutting duplication instead. So can you give us some examples of where there is duplication within the enterprise budget? Yeah, and, and, and just to clarify what I was saying is that within that finance and economy portfolio, you will see some areas uh, going up, but not all areas can go up. So, for example, training and employability are going up. So I think one of the, 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 the two examples I would give is the National Strategy for Economic Transformation um, calls on all parts of the enterprise and skills landscape to focus on fewer objectives and to do those really well. So, for example, on productivity, to really focus on productivity, to focus on some of the new markets, to focus on entrepreneurship. And I would like to think that in focusing on those key objectives, they align all their spend and they align their workforce to achieving those objectives. Um, that ultimately will mean that looking across the board, there will be areas that some public bodies are better at than others. So, for example, I think Scottish National Investment Bank has a really um, important role to play in scale-ups. Now, Scottish Enterprise have a great track record when it comes to start-ups. So, actually, between the two of them, Scottish Enterprise focusing on start-ups, Scottish National Investment Bank focusing on scale-ups, and both of them trying to ensure that they're not just duplicating each other's efforts would be an example, I think, where aligned to NSET and also aligned to where, they, um, to where they have a track record of success is, you know, and, and Scottish Enterprise has generated significant revenues for the public purse as a result of very effective uh, investments. So that would be one example. The second example I would make is the one I've already talked about, which is a recurring theme when it comes to business grants. If you're a business, where do you go first for grant support? Do you go to Business Gateway? Do you go to SE? Do you go to High? Do you go to Visit Scotland, perhaps, if you're uh, in the tourism community? Um, do you go to the Scottish Government? So I think right now it's quite, a conf quite confusing for, for businesses. Uh, but in each of those organisations, there will be teams doing very similar things. So actually, through you know, collaboration, discussion, how do we make that more effective, a more effective relationship for, for business. And I think there's good, there's good practice already and uh, the enterprise agencies are completely on board and have already started some of that work. So do you see some of those agencies potentially going then? No, no, I don't. No, I think they all have... Just a, people an, within them going, I guess. No, I think they have, all have an important role to play, but I think they need to make sure that they are as efficient as possible and focused on the, the, the core objectives that we've set. And they're, you know, certainly based on my um, extensive conversations with the enterprise agencies of Visit Scotland, they are, they are on board with that and they, and they get that. Are they on board with a reduction in their budget? That, that would be they're unusual in, for oh, an organisation. See, see this, is the, this is the fundamental challenge, I think, with some of this discussion, is if we are more effective at serving the citizen, by extension, you will have a more efficient public body. And what's, what's, what's not to appreciate 
about improving outcomes for citizens, improving outcomes for businesses, making sure that every penny of resource that we spend is actually delivering our objectives. Well, I guess that ties me back to the other thing, because, you know, from the, the, the medium-term financial strategy, there's little mention of the national performance framework, really. Is that really truly embedded right through this document, would you say? Um, I would um, say that, yep. It certainly it's embedded through the resource spending review. The medium-term financial strategy focuses a lot more on um, the, the funding we have available. Um, the resource spending review focuses a lot on the, how, how we're going to actually spend it. So I'd make that distinction between the two documents. Um, but yeah, I, I'll go back to identifying what the, the four objectives are. Tackling child poverty is completely in line with the national performance framework. Transitioning to net zero, completely in line with the uh, national performance framework. Economic recovery, completely in line, and resilient public services. I would say that this resource spending review is far more focused on outcomes than perhaps many things are. So, OK, you mentioned tackling child poverty, but what about preventing child poverty? I think that's difficult when you have cuts to the local government budget, you have cuts to the university budget, you have cuts to the enterprise budget. Surely that's the areas where we should be investing. So, to, you know, to prevent child poverty as opposed to trying to tackle child poverty? I think that the greatest contributor to child poverty over the last 10 years has been UK government austerity as backed up by the University of Glasgow's report most recently. And uh, we will do all that we can to mitigate, but we are limited in what we can do when it comes to mitigation. We will continue to invest our money through a different approach to social security. But ultimately, much of what we spend is mitigation and if you fix that at source, we could probably redeploy that funding elsewhere. But this government all, always talks about, you know, early intervention, prevention. And a lot of these areas that you're cutting would be tackling early intervention. Things like local government, you know, they can tackle the, the source before it's a problem. And that's why I'm sort of slightly confused with some of the things you've said today and some of the things I see in this um, in this. Can, uh, can I just report. say, we're spending £1.8 billion in Scottish Child Payment, which will go up to £25 per week which will just about mitigate the cut to universal credit of £20 per week. But you're making cuts in areas that could, pre that could prevent child poverty. So that's my, my point I'm making. Uh, last thing I want to talk about is um, tax. So you, you mentioned you, know, you, you go on the, the SFC forecast. So the SFC is forecasting that um, in terms of the higher rate threshold it would remain frozen as part of the forecast baseline. So will that, is that something you do see frozen, which means, you know, it says here, higher rate taxpayers pay an extra 653 in income tax in 23-24, and that would rise to 1,317 in 26-27. So do you, do you think that's something that you will So we will to? update um, all tax policy in advance of every budget. And um, I'm not, I won't be drawn uh, today on setting tax plans for subsequent budgets, but we will um, set out those tax plans in, a, in advance of every budget. Obviously, the SFC have to go on the basis of assumptions, and um, the intention here was certainly not to uh, determine tax policy for future years. OK, thanks, Convener. OK, thank you. Daniel, to be followed by Ross. Thank you, Convener. Um, I just want to go back to the points around uh, public sector headcount. So the, 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 the aim is to return to pre-COVID levels. And I accept that you're saying that that will be done essentially through capping the total uh, payroll at value, but not in terms of uh, levels. And I understand that. But there is a certain arithmetical uh, kind of uh, outcome from, from that, I mean, first of all, if you're going to do that, as John Mason was pointing out, half of that 30,000 is in the NHS. That's not going to be reduced. So, in essence, in the remaining, remaining areas, they've got two options, either reducing people's pay levels or reducing those headcounts. And if you're going to maintain NHS headcount at what it is currently, and it's half, that means those other areas will need to reduce their headcounts by double the amount that they've increased by. Just to, to, to highlight that, in the civil service, that's 4,000 is the increase. Local government, 7,000 the increase. And I'm going quarter four 2019 to quarter four 2021 here. And finally, public corporations, 5,000. Now, you've refused to be drawn on local government, but you do have control over civil service headcount. So are we going to see a reduction of 8,000 civil servants in the Scottish Government? What we're going to see over the next um, four years, and it's important that it's understood that this is over the longer term, because it's not 
it's not um, over a, a one-year period, is, um, yes, a, a reduction in workforce and in headcount to pre-pandemic levels. And there's a, there's a number of different ways that you can do that. So you can through that, do that through um, effective vacancy and recruitment management. You can do that through redeploying uh, staff. Uh, all of it has to be done in collaboration with trade unions and through discussion with trade unions uh, to do this uh, importantly. Uh, we have a, a policy of, of no compulsory redundancies. Uh, we'll update public sector pay policy in advance of every budget. But I think the key here is that with a resource spending review, you're not trying to drive reform over the space of 12 months. You're trying to drive reform over the space of, of four years. And so by 2026, 2027, we want to see the total size of the devolved public sector workforce uh, at, at uh, pre-COVID levels. You know, we, even within the health force, we know that for a national care service, which was an example I used earlier, there's a lot of people already working in care. So, you know, it, it, you have to take that into account. It's about effective management across the board rather than setting arbitrary targets over a very short period of time. I don't think I was either suggesting arbitrary targets or that the, the, the time frame was 12 months. I, I, I appreciate that the, the time frame is, you know, four to five years. But nonetheless, do you, you might not want to put a number on it, but if we are going to essentially maintain health service headcount in broad terms, albeit with some change, if you have that macro figure and you're going to protect half of the increase, the other areas are going to have to increase by more than the, the, the figure that they have gone up by. That's just an arithmetic necessity, is it not? So therefore, now you don't necessarily need to put a figure. It, it, the headcount reduction in the civil service will need to be more than the 3,800 it went up by in the COVID period. Is that not just an arithmetical necessity. I mean, and some of that will be in the health service, so in terms of civil service. But I think, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not disputing the sentiment behind your question, which is that I have gone out and said we need to reset the size of the workforce, we will freeze pay bill, and ultimately we want to see a return to pre-COVID levels. Now, the public sector is, is large. I think it's a approximately about 470k uh, um, in terms of FTE. And we will need to see that return to pre-pandemic levels. Let that will need to be managed across the board. And I think that's where my concern with your arbitrary figures, even the 15k in the health service, is, is, putting, an, is putting arbitrary figures on the other side of well, that. OK, well, let, let me avoid the figures altogether. If, if the aggregate point is going to come out at, uh, at, at, at 29,500. Um, and some areas are not going to have to, to return to pre-COVID levels, then other areas are going to have to go further. Is that not just a statement of fact? I think that is a statement of fact, yeah. Thank you. Um, one of the areas that I think you, you disputed um, at the statement last week was around the overall position in terms of productivity growth and, and uh, wage growth in Scotland. Now, the, the Scottish Fiscal Commission is pretty clear. In paragraph 3.39, it states uh, productivity growth has stalled in Scotland since 2015. I mean, likewise, if we look at income tax uh, uh, receipts and their projections, again, the, 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 the Scottish Fiscal Commission are clear that, that wage growth in Scotland is slower than the UK average. And that is a trend which, if you look at ONS figures, actually goes back to 2016, where not a single Scottish region has outperformed the UK average in that period. Um, and prior to 2016, Scotland had typically outperformed the UK average. And I'm not talking about the, the higher performing areas of the UK, the UK average. I mean, you do accept that that's a fact, and do you think there's sufficient focus on driving up jobs and wages? Uh, because ultimately, that's what we need to do to increase the amount of money that we have to spend on the public service, as well as being good in and of itself. Yeah. No, and, and I think, you know, th there's, a, there's a more balanced answer to that, and hopefully a more balanced question, too, behind it, than uh, necessarily in the Chamber. Because we accepted, I accepted, in the National Strategy for Economic Transformation, that increasing productivity is one of the most important objectives that we can have as a government, as a society, as an economy. 
So if we take that as red, that increasing productivity matters, and we need to up our game when it comes to uh, increasing productivity. Um, I think that you still have to accept that between 2007 and 2019, we did see significant growth in productivity. Now, why is that important? It's not to, with, with productivity in Scotland growing by 10.7% compared with 5.2% for, for the rest of the UK. Why is that important? Well, I think it goes back to the question of you know, what do you need to stop doing, which is perhaps dragging productivity, but what do you need to keep doing that might be boosting productivity? And that's what the national strategy tries to get um, underneath. So, you know, our economy is, is recovering right now. We have the unique circumstance of record low um, unemployment of 3.2%. There's not much more we can do around labour force if unemployment is at 3.2% with the exception of the point I mentioned earlier around trying to work with those that are classified as economically inactive to get them into the, into the labour market. There's obviously work that you can do on, on migration. But I think, I didn't catch all that the SFC said, but they were also quite clear that Scotland is exposed to an ageing demographic and it's also exposed on the basis that, um, when it comes to earnings, to the oil and gas industry. So where financial services uh, down south has seen a significant increase, I think about 16%, if I remember correctly, I need to double check my, my figures, about 16%. It, there's obviously been a challenging time for, for the oil and gas industry in Scotland, which has had an impact on earnings. So where you see, so, so I, I don't think you can, I think you have to dis distinguish a little bit between wage and, and, and productivity. They're mm -hmm. linked, but I think there's two different answers to two different questions. I mean, they are, they are inextricably linked, and ultimately, if you want to drive one, you, you have to uh, deliver on the other. I mean, the one thing I would just sort of take, I mean, the demographics is definitely an issue for Scotland, but in terms of the fiscal framework, obviously, that is to, to a degree indexed. So, I mean, I think that, 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 that looking at average earnings growth is, is, is the fundamental. But just coming back to the point around productivity, and I don't disagree, and I, and I, and I, I think that the... Uh, NSET does a good job of narrating the issue. I, I would still take issues to whether or not it has sufficient focus on solutions. And if we listen to what Professor Ulf was just saying in, earlier on in our session, um, the, 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 there is a particular issue that, that Scotland has around uh, labour market participation. Um, uh, 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 and by his own admission, they're not in clear what that is. And it, but the way he put it was that the, the overall labour force is probably of the correct size, but it's not necessarily in the right places. Now, that suggests to me that we need interventions to redeploy people, reskill people, and ensure that people are maximising wages. Now, that's not just about people who are out of the, the, the labour market altogether, although it is in part. But it just strikes me that, that if that is the case, I wonder about the priorities in the spending review. Because while you've highlighted employability fund, that is not the entirety of skills spend. There's a significant proportion within the Scottish Fiscal Commission, uh, sorry, Scottish Funding Council, I'm getting my SFCs mixed up, apologies. Hmm. Scottish Funding Council's budget, which is, goes to colleges, but that's flat cash throughout the spending review period, 8% cut. Likewise, universities have a significant contribution to play to, to skills. And indeed, uh, the SDS's budget is within uh, uh, those budget lines as well, and it is flat cash, 8%. So there are at least four budget lines, four areas of spend, which contribute to that skills, making sure that people are, as Professor Wolf put it, in the right places in the labour market. Only one of them is going up. All the other three are being cut. Is that the right priority, Cabinet Secretary? Well, I do think that prioritising employability and training within finance and economy portfolio is the right call. Now, that means if you have one area going up, obviously you, have, uh, you can't maintain that increase across the board. Um, but, you know, and, 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 and that requirement just now needs to be a very flexible training offer. So universities and colleges have an important role to play and they do need to adapt and uh, you know, um, be cognizant of what the future uh, skills demand are going to be. But in terms of employability training, which, as I said, is one of the, the very few lines that is going up significantly, that is endeavouring to try and provide a more flexible retraining, reskilling offer to 
uh, individuals that need to retrain and reskill. Having said all that, I go back to the, 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 my, my starting position here, which is a very difficult outlook based on the funding we have available. And I imagine that around this room and across the chamber, there will be different asks for where I should be spending more. I've already heard some of them today around local government, universities, employability. And if I could spend significantly more on every line, then, you know, of course every finance secretary would want to do that. I can't. I am constrained by a funding envelope. And what I have sought to do is to be fair across the board. Now, why it's even more challenging is because our spending power has decreased in terms of, in terms of inflation. You can't, you can't get away from that. So what you are counting as real terms cuts is, is higher because I have less spending power because of inflation. So we have tried to protect, but if you want to see any line go up, I'm afraid on this resource spending review, which is different from a budget, I don't really have anywhere to go. But, but, but even employability is really only in the last year that it goes up by any significant amount at all. So then you therefore have four budget lines, which are certainly in the early years are all probably experiencing significant real terms uh, cuts. Is that not, so is that, and it's almost certainly on aggregate across the five years, skill spending has an aggregate cut. And if you're wanting to drive up average earnings, is that not inconsistent? Um, Gary might want to come in a little bit more widely on, on, on earnings, but I go back to my fundamental point here, which is I cannot overspend by a penny. I can only spend what the SFC think is reasonable for me to receive. And therefore, if you want any part of that resource spending review to increase, it has to come from elsewhere in the pot because my spending assumptions and my funding assumptions have got to be based on as much fact as possible, which is what they are. But if you drive up earnings faster than the UK, now you can't do that in the short term, but in the medium term, it's not an unreasonable ambition. You can improve the amount of money you have to spend, and certainly within a five-year time period. Is that unreasonable to expect you that? But you certainly can't no, do that if you cut skills funding. It's can a you? very, very reasonable um, assumption to make. My question to you would be that if I had done that in terms of significant increases on the four lines you're asking me for, you'd be here asking me a question about four other lines that had been severely cut. I'm really trying to clarify the choices you've made, and this is clearly one of them. Uh, and the choice I've made here is to see employability and skills increase and other budget lines protected. I'll leave it there. Okay, thank you. Hugh Ross. Thank you. Convener, um, just to return to Daniel's line of question around um, productivity and, and wage growth, um, and this is something that I asked the SFC, but by that point you were outside the door, so you probably will have, will have missed that. Um, their assumptions around increasing productivity are, are based on uh, more people getting into the right jobs, i.e. more productive, higher paid jobs. Given what's just been discussed about the fact that you know, the, the workforce is not going to increase. That means either low wage sectors becoming higher wage, so wages in areas like retail, hospitality, tourism, et cetera, going up, or a continued exodus from those sectors into to higher wage sectors. In terms of the government's overall strategic priorities for the economy, what, is the, what balance of those two trends would you like to see? Given that we've, we do already have acute labour shortages in these sectors, usually tied to, to issues of, of wages in those sectors. Is it the government's strategic, is it a more of a priority to grow high wage sectors or to try and raise wages in these existing sectors where we're seeing shortages because of those issues? I would say that our immediate priority is to embed fair work. So it goes back to all the questions we've talked about around poverty. It's gone back to questions around productivity. Um, if you have fairer work conditions, if people are in secure, well-paid employment and get paid a reasonable wage, then that delivers multiple benefits, both for our economy, but also for the overall uh, cost of the, of the public sector. And I would say that our primary focus right now is on embedding fair work principles. It's certainly where we've seen employers also wanting to focus because at a time of high, high demand, 
and lower supply, they've got to distinguish themselves. Having said that, we are particularly exposed when it, by the fact that a lot of um, the highest earners are in a very few industries. So that means when there is a downturn in oil and gas, that has a disproportionately large impact on both our tax revenues and on um, our, our economic outlook. So I think there's a, an argument there too to try and make sure that we are we're, we, we diversify, um, but also to, you know, taking into account the impact that has. So, if, if that's the case, then would it be fair to say that the priority, say for Scottish Enterprise fixed budget, the grants that they are issuing, the strategic priority for them is far more aligned with um, targeting low wage sectors for offers of grants, but with attached fair work conditions, rather than issuing grants to uh, in, in, to businesses that are already in a high wage sector. Well, the way that we're doing the former is through embedding conditionality. So you shouldn't be able to access grant support, for example, without signing up to Fair Work Principles. So in a sense, it shouldn't even necessarily be a, a particular focus. It should be the status quo. It should be the norm that you can only access government support if you um, adhere to, to, to Fair Work Principles. Um, I don't think it's an easy either or, because we also know that from the, the NSET work that was done, that where Scotland has some of the greatest potential is in some of the high growth sectors. So, for example, in, in technology, for example, in renewables, in these areas. Uh, so I don't think you can neglect, for example, some of your core industries who should expect only to receive support if they meet those conditions. But in terms of future growth ambitions, which I know is where we maybe have a slight uh, difference of opinion. Um, so just on those, how to define growth, not yeah, on the principle of growth of those at growth all. In terms of growth ambitions, um, we, 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 we do want to see far greater rates of successful scale-ups, knowing that that's where a lot of jobs are created. And just one final question. Uh, given, you know, as, as you've pointed out, the single biggest factor affecting so many discussions we've had this morning is the current rate of inflation. What discussions have you had with the Treasury about the impact of inflation on the budget and the potential of inflation proofing the Scottish budget? Yeah, we, we have had discussions, and I'm actually seeing um, the Chief Secretary to Treasury next week, um, and we'll continue these discussions, I'm sure, on, on the fact that our current assumptions around block grant is based largely on an out-of-date spending review that doesn't take into account inflation. Um, I will continue to, to make those points to them. Uh, I certainly would like to see, at the very least, some of the review of the fiscal framework taking into account what, role, what impact uh, inflation has on our spending power, but also on the way that certain elements uh, keep track with, with inflation. So, those conversations will continue their conversations and I am generally an optimistic person but I've been having those conversations for a very long time. Thanks very much. Thank you, Convener. Thank you very much. And just one final question for me and it is, I hope, on an optimistic note. I mean, in Section 2.4 uh, of the document, um, Stronger, Fairer, Greener Economy. There's a lot of really positives in there. You talk about, again, the National Strategy for Economic Transformation, stimulating entrepreneurship, building new markets, increasing productivity, developing skills, embedding entrepreneurship. Um, you talk about an investor panel, inward investment plan, export growth plan. And I think these are all very positive. Um, what, what kind of impact do you believe that will have by the end of the, of the period, actually, that we've been discussing up to 20? 627 in terms of uh, you know increasing investment um, jobs um, you know um, job retention in fact because many businesses sometimes we get to a certain level move outside Scotland so what, what impact do you think that new kind of cultural change will actually have on Scotland and, it, the, and the revenue base if we get it right it will have a huge impact it will have a hugely positive impact the resource spending review covers a period that's just short of halfway to the National Strategy for Economic Transformation outcomes, which are over 10 years. But if we get this right, if we invest our funding in achieving outcomes and objectives, not in maintaining the status quo, then we can shift the dial on these things. If we just defend the status quo, 
then we'll get the same outcomes. And I think all of us have an aspiration and an ambition to actually deliver what the resource spending review sets out in terms of uh, economic growth, in terms of you know, tackling child poverty and resilient public services. Okay, well, thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary, for um, spending so much time uh, of your morning and responding to our questions. Um, that uh, ends today's deliberations. So, call this meeting to an end. Thank you.